study of Ayurveda is very, very beneficial. It was practiced with great popularity in ancient times. And as we could see yesterday from the scholars who spoke here, it is still being practiced with great rigor. And it can come to our rescue in the current age as well. We had sessions on the life Ayurveda for holistic well-being. We had some papers on Ayurveda for humanity, person-centric, integration of lifestyle and diet in Ayurveda, and nature-centered treatment. Today, we begin with this session five, and the theme of this session is Ayurveda and mental well-being. And the speaker is our co coordinator for the conference, Vaidya P. Ram Manohar. And his topic is Ayurveda and an Indian paradigm for psychology. He is the research director of Amrita School, Ayurve Amrita School of Ayurveda. He received BAMS degree from Bharathiyar University, Coimbatore in 1991 and MD from Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences in Bengaluru in 2001. He has been contributing in the field of Ayurvedic research since the last 30 years. And I think it is some 20 or 22 years ago, I saw him at S. Vyasa, Bangalore, where I was also a participant and he was a young scholar at that time. I was very impressed with his presentation and he has carried forward his study, his publications include research papers in index journals and chapters in books. In 2022, he was honored with the Ayurveda Ratan Award from the All Party Parliamentary Group on Indian Traditional Sciences, Houses of Parliament, United Kingdom. In 2022, he also received the Dhanvantari Award from Nature Fit. In 2021, he received the Dr. Keshav Baliram Hedgebar Healing Honor 21 for his contributions to facilitating integrative and preventive medicine. He also received the Bhishak Bhushan Puraskaram from Vagbhat Sarani for his contributions in the field of Ayurvedic research. In 2017, he was honored with Dr. C. Dwarka Nath Memorial Award by IAASTAM for contributions to contemporary interpretations of the principle of Ayurveda. He received Purnottaram Ayurveda Ashram gave him in 2016, Punthottam Ayurveda Ashrama gave him the Bharadvaja Puraskaram Award for Vaidya Sundarlal Joshi Smriti Shodh Puraskar by the Maha Gujarat Medical Society. So you can see that winning these several awards speaks of his commitment and his continuous dedication to the study of Ayurveda. He published in the Journal of Clinical Rheumatology and Annals of Rheumatic Diseases that won him the excellence in Integrative Medicine Research Award from the European Society of Integrative Medicine in 2012. He has made research visits to various countries across the globe for the promotion of Ayurveda. I invite you, Dr. Ram Manohar, for your presentation on Ayurveda and mental well-being. You know, 30 minutes for your talk and 10 minutes for your question and answers. Thank you, <clears throat> Shashi Prabha, madam. Thank you so much for the introduction and <clears throat> the opportunity to share my views on mental well-being from an Ayurvedic perspective. So the topic I have chosen is Ayurveda and an Indian paradigm for psychology. <clears throat> I'd like to make some very radical statements at the outset. Now, what we had in India is not psychology. We don't have psychology in the Indian tradition for reason, because we don't have Manashastra, but what we have is the science of consciousness or Atma Vidya, and it's a very big difference. And understanding this difference is going to help us to 
discover a new paradigm that can change the way psychology is understood world over. This is the key message that I want to give. So there is no psychology in Ayurveda or the Indian tradition. Yet the Ashtanga Hadeya begins by saying that the supreme physician is the one who eliminates the diseases of the mind. Ragadi Rogan, Satatan, Shaktan, Asheshagaya, Prasridan, Asheshan, Autsukya Moha, Radhidan, Jaghana, Yopurva Vaidyaya, Namostutas. So a physician becomes a physician only if he treats the mind. That is the concept in Ayurveda. But then how do we say that there's no psychology in Ayurveda? And even more intriguing, is that we have psychiatry, Buddha Vidya, Graha Chikitsa. So the healthy mind is actually integrated with the body and self. So it is not studied separately. It's not possible for us to study a healthy mind without reference to the self and the body, because the mind is the interface between the self and the body, according to the Indian thought system. The sick mind is in disharmony with the body and self. So studying the mind separately itself makes it actually go out of harmony. And this is the biggest problem with modern psychology. It's trying to study the mind independently and it fails. So Indian tradition studies the mind with reference to the self. So we have Atma Vidya. Modern science studies the mind with reference to the body or brain. Even they are not able to study the mind independently because it is a shadow. It is a shadow of the self. It is a moon. It doesn't have a light on its own. So we have psychology or which is more in terms of neuropsychology in the modern tradition, referring everything of the mind to the brain. The, the, so what I want to say is there is this lost psychology of ancient India, which we can recover only by examining the spiritual traditions. Because in the West, science emerged in opposition to religion. Everything religious throughout the world if there is a shade of religion, everything gets dismissed, you know, because of this, the way science emerged. It is a problem in the development of science. It's not a problem with spirituality or religion. In India, we had never this conflict between science and spirituality. So it's seamlessly a seamless continuum, science entering into spirituality and spirituality embracing science. But nevertheless, a lot of modern psychologists, I just want to give one example were influenced by Eastern thought. Maslow's concepts of peak experiences and self-actualization, many of us, I didn't when I didn't know this until uh, quite recently, I read a very engaging article that Maslow's concepts of peak experiences and self-actualization are all Eastern in origin. A little known fact about Maslow is that the hierarchy of needs theory is inspired by the Panchakosha theory of Vedanta which discusses five planes of consciousness, Annamaya Kosha and all those. I'm not going into the details. So for those who are interested, you can read Satya Shilan, Satya Shilan 2016. So psychology is inseparably woven with the narratives of spirituality in India and the Yoga Sutras and Bhagavad Gita are really examples. Who will think of them as textbooks of psychology? So Ayurveda has derived the understanding of the human being. And I think this is what is going to bring, this is where the paradigm shift has to happen. How we look at the human being itself. And we all know in the yogic tradition, the Vedanta tradition, we have the theory of the five koshas. And we'll see how this has been articulated in many different ways. And how Ayurveda is complemented. Ayurveda does not use the terms of the koshas, but it still refers to the same reality. So we have Anandamaya, Vijnanamaya, Manomaya, Pranamaya, and Annamaya Kosha. And we'll see that this beautiful five-dimensional view is the core of the Bhagavad Gita itself. Atma, referring to the Anandamaya Kosha, who is considered as the Rithi. Buddhi is the Sarathi, and it is representing the Vijnanamaya Kosha. Manas is the Pragraha, representing the Manomaya Kosha. Indriya, Hayani, this represents the Pranamaya Kosha, and Sharira or the Ratha represents the Annamaya Kosha. So you can see how the same model has been explained, you know, using different imageries in different contexts. And now I like to bring Bhagavad Gita. And in Ayurveda also, this model of the Bhagavad Gita is also referred to. A sick person is said to be a Bhrashta Sara Devadrata. A chariot without a chariot. That is how Ayurveda has depicted a mentally sick person. And you can see here, even though Ayurveda does not directly refer to the Bhagavad Gita, it's the imagery from the Bhagavad Gita that is used to describe a mentally sick person. 
In Ayurveda, we instead of calling them as koshas, we refer to five entities, Atma, Buddhi, Manas, Indriya and Sharir. This is how Ayurveda refers to the Panchakosha. So this understanding of the human being as a complex five-dimensional being very much influenced the way Manas or mind was studied in the Indian tradition. Sometimes we reduce the human being also to a four-dimensional uh, entity, Atma, Sattva. This is how Ayurveda defines life. Sharira, Indriya, Sattva, Atma, Samyogo, Dhari, Jivitam, where Indriya here includes the Manas also because Manas is an Ubhaya Indriya. So for convenience, in different contexts, different models are uh, you know, proposed. We also have a three-dimensional model of the human being, Sattva, Atma, Shariram, Cha, Trayameda, Tridandavat, Logas, Tishtadi, Samyoga, Tatra, Sarvam, Pradishtidam. And in all this, we can see mind as a very important interface between the body and the self. And it is in this perspective that Ayurveda has tried to study the mind and understand how we can promote the health of the mind and how to help it when it is sick. So certain basic paradigmatical differences are that in the Indian tradition, the primacy of consciousness is the basis. It's a basic premise. Consciousness is primary. Matter is a function of consciousness. Whereas the Western worldview takes an opposite stance. Mind and consciousness are reduced to functions of the brain. So this has very much greatly influenced the way psychology has developed. So basic premises are different. And according to Ayurveda, the mind survives the body. It is displaced in the time-space continuum again and again to re-emerge in another physical embodiment. So we, we become mental beings when we are dead. Uh, this is how Charaka Samhita talks about this process that the mind in a sukshma form survives the body. But the consciousness survives even the mind. When the mind detaches from the body, we sleep or we die. So sleeping and dying are very close to each other. It is complete dis distinct engagement from even the pranamaya kosha is death. Disengagement by the, from the Andamaya Kosha is sleep. When the mind dissolves in consciousness, we get liberated. And sleep is just an attempt. Every day, you know, we are reminding ourselves that that is the way. We have to disengage from the body, but then in sleep we don't find our own self. In meditation we find it. So the slogan for liberation in Ayurveda is preserve the body and kill the mind. So the body has to be preserved till the mind is dissolved in the self. So very interesting concepts are there about the mind. And one, one such basic thing which gives us a very good insight into psychology from the Ayurvedic perspective is the idea that mind is not conscious. Ayurvedic texts clearly point out that it's not mind that is conscious. Mind is active. Achetanam kriya vachamanaha. So this distinction of what is consciousness and how it is different from the mind is a hallmark of the ancient approach to understanding uh, psychology. The word psyche itself is a very loose concept. I mean, uh, it includes the soul, the self, so many things. It is a, it's a bucket, a very complex bucket of, you know, crisscrossing ideas where we lose clarity if we go deep and analyze. So from the Indian perspective, which Ayurveda also, uh, you know, reflects, the self is the brisk witness. Drashta pasyati hi kriya. The mind is actually the doer. Manakritam kritam na sharira kritam. It is not the body that performs actions, but the mind. The body is only an instrument. Sharira madhyam khalu dharma sadhanam. Yuktasya manasa atasya nirdishyande vibho kriya. The vibhu atma becomes active because of its association with the mind, not the body. It is a mind, the prayatna of the mind that continuously makes the body to engage in various actions. So the body is only an expression of the mind. So if you look at the Ayurvedic model of the mind, I am trying to say many things very quickly just to give a glimpse of the potential that is there in our tradition to, I, so the problem that we are face falling into is that 
many Western disciplines emerged and we are trying to reinvent Ayurveda and Indian systems in the image of these new disciplines that have emerged in the West. I am trying to argue for why do we need a psychology in the Indian tradition just because there is psychology in the West. Should we not think differently that we have to have a science of consciousness that will subsume the modern uh, discipline of psychology and make it more complete and harmonious. That is what we should argue for because what the Indian tradition tells us is that it is not a new psychology that we need but a new science of consciousness and psychology will be included in that. So Ayurveda depicts the mind as atomic and single moving at unimaginable speed. The mind becomes extroverted when it connects to the senses and body and it becomes introverted when it connects to the self. So there are so many Chakrapani's descriptions I will show that just now. Atma hyatra samsari bhoga yatana tve napi preda sacha hridaya pradesha eva sukha dukkha dibala bada itya nubhava siddham. Tena hridaya shrida iva atma. So the mind is, in Ayurveda, I was, when I was a student, I was very surprised. We got so much of descriptions of brain in modern science and medicine. Ayurveda seemed to be deficient because I had misunderstood that statement, Hridayam Chetanasthanam. Hridayam is Chetanasthanam. So I had, we, we all had the impression that they were talking about mind being, you know, located in the heart. And when we studied modern physiology and anatomy, the brain should actually be in the brain. And until, you know, the Bhela Samhita is one of the texts which solves this problem by saying, Shiras Talvandaragadam Sarvendriya Param Manaha. The Bhela Samhita clearly says the mind is located between the palate and the tip of the skull. Tatrastam Taddi Vishaya Nindriya Nam Rasadigan. So there it engages with the sense organs. But the same text says that Hridayam Chaitana Asthanam. Even Bhela Samhita says that Hridayam or heart is the Chaitana Sthana. So how can this contradiction be resolved? So until we understand that according to Ayurveda, the Manas is Achetanam. Chaitana here means consciousness. So the heart is said to be the seat of consciousness or the place where we uh, experience pain and pleasure. When I say I, my hand automatically goes to my chest, not to my head. Because that idea of jivatva, that I, that uh, self-identity is associated with the heart region. So, though all pervading the focus of consciousness is in the physical body or the heart, and Ayurveda is talking about this dual engagement of the mind, which Chakrapani is describing here. Tatha manobi prayena hridyevatishtadi yada uparata kriyam manaha hridyevatishtadi. When the mind is inactive, it comes back to the self. And that is meditation. You know, disengaging the mind from the sense organs and bringing it atmasthe manasisthire. That is what the state of meditation is mentioned in uh, Bhagavad Gita also. And Ayurveda also describes the same uh, statement. that the, So the extroverted and introverted mind have been very clearly distinguished. Now when it comes to the body-mind, Ayurveda considers the body-mind as a seamless continuum. When one is affected, the other is also affected. So in Ayurveda, there is no body-mind split. The body and mind make up one whole. Then the relationship between the body and mind are compared to that between the ghee and the iron pot. Taptajya gadayo riva. If you pour hot ghee into an iron pot, the iron pot will get heated. If you put ghee into a hot iron pot, the ghee will get heated. This is what the text say. So the, anything that affects the body will affect the mind also. And anything that affects the... So all diseases are essentially psychosomatic in Ayurveda. And that is why Ayurvedic Acharya said right from the beginning that Ragadi Rogan, those, those, he is the true physician who heals the mind because the source of all physical illnesses in the ultimate analysis is also in the mind. So the mind expresses itself through the body. Today we have theories about PNEI axis. And if I compare it with the Ayurvedic, it seems to be just one aspect of the Ayurvedic understanding of the crosstalk between the body and the mind. PNEI means psychoneuroendocrino immunology. And through different models, though different models, a striking semblance you can see. 
in ayurveda it is manas vata pitta and kapha that is how we see this axis of the body mind manas has the trigunas sattva rajas tamas body has the tridoshas vata pitta kapha so in modern system pnei the psych as i told you the psych is not so well defined uh, in ayurveda we, we we would say that the pnei axis is actually much more complex and through ayurvedic model of triguna and tridosha we can redefine the pnei axis in all its complexity so when so simply very at a gross level we can also say but i am not so much in favor of making direct correlations you can say that a neurological regulation represents vada endocrinological regulation pitta maybe immunological regulation kapha so even without knowing pnai axis is pointing to the you know the three regulatory systems which ayurveda would call as tridoshas but that's just for you know a very superficial correlation what i am arguing is that we need to look at the ayurvedic model of trigunas and tridoshas to understand the cross talk of the body and the mind in a much better way we also have the gut brain axis and ayurveda the gut is a nervous system in itself nabhi is such an important location for vayu in ayurveda modern medicine is nowadays talking about gut brain and also heart brain but according to ayurveda there is already a much more powerful brain the skin brain and that is why touch is so important in ayurveda skin is a powerful medium to influence the nervous system as well as the mind in ayurveda in ayurvedic treatments abhyanga we think of that as just an oil massage for so ayurveda sa jarashrama vataha abhyanga majare nityam sa jarashrama vataha it can slow down the aging it completely works on your regulatory systems just applying oil on the skin has profound systemic effects according to ayurveda and i think the next brain that modern medicine may discover is the skin brain correcting agni is such an important step in the management of mental illnesses also and i want to point out today there is a you know many things that ayurveda very graphically described in chakrapani is telling tatha hyati chintana tatha dukha vesha dwa ஹிருதயமேவீடியோமயோபதிஸ்ரீஸ்ட்ரீஸ்ட்ரீஸ்ட்ரீஸ்ட்ரீஸ்ட்ரீஸ்ட்ரீஸ்ட்ரீஸ
that real bliss can come in. Nirajas tamaha, not being under the influence of rajas and tamas, emotional maturity. This is another attribute of, you know, mental health. And evolving to the states of yoga and moksha continuously. Because only in yoga, moksha cha sarvasam, vedana nama avartanam. This is what uh, Charaka Samhita says. So determinants of mental health in Ayurveda, as I'm coming closer, I will go a little quickly. Thoughts, emotions, behavior, food, environment, interpersonal relationships, society, all these things influence mental health. And Ayurveda gives a very elaborate description of all the factors that contribute to mental health and how, you know, behavior, waking up at Brahma Mahurta is to increase Satvaguna more than everything else. Brahma Mahurta Uttishtet. So, uh, it is to protect your ayus and to protect your ayus, sadvritam is necessary. Sadvritam is not possible unless you have that sattvic framework. So trigunas and the mind, this is another very important concept because how trigunas also seem to be influencing the mind and tridoshas also seem to be influencing the mind. And understanding how they interact together is going to throw up very interesting you know, ideas. So, Sattva is a guna rajas. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Sorry, that's my laptop. It's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. This is the problem with artificial intelligence. <laughs> Chat GPT shuru ho gaya. Isko thoda sa pata idhar ghuma do. So, uh, ah. Thomas, good. As long as it it is restricted to rest. Rajas is good as long as it makes you active. But beyond that, it brings in laziness, procrastination, disinterest, depression, and self-harm. So the Ayurveda describes this whole process of, of how tamas overpowers you, leads you to dis destruction. Rajas is needed because otherwise we cannot be active. But if it promotes thought, diarrhea, restlessness, irritability, impatience, it will ultimately lead to violence. On the other hand, sattva helps you to accept reality, harmony, centeredness. And then it, when you are in sattvic mode, everything happens harmoniously. So according to Ayurveda, there is no good luck. It is if you are in a sattvic mode, everything happens spontaneously and you would call that as good luck. So this very quickly, I want to highlight tridosha is more about instinct and reflex. Trigunas is more about conscious, you know, effort that we can take. So Ayurveda says that our mental makeup we can change. Anybody can be tamasic or rajasic, they can become sattvic. But if you are vatik, pitik, paitik or kapaja person, that will not change. So if a vata person will always have fear, his first reflex will be fear. A pitta person will have anger. A kapha person will be indifferent. So the tridoshas influence you to make your instinctive response. Whereas trigunas help you. So uh, if you are sattvic in your mind, but vata as a physical constitution, your first response in any situation would be fear. But if since you are sattvic, you can overcome. You will become conscious of that fear and you will be able to overcome it. This is the difference. So conscious behavior is related to trigunas and reflexive instinctual behavior is related to the tridoshas. So Ayurveda says, Manage your body and transform your mind. You have to manage your physical constitution, but you, you can completely transform your mind. Whatever, even Varna, Ashrama, Dharma, we say a tamasic person can become sattvic. That is the whole purpose of the Varna, Varna Ashrama, Dharma. So I, I'm just coming to the close of my, uh, it is, uh, it's 25 minutes since I started. Five minutes went with the introduction, but I'll complete quickly. Ayurvedic strategy in mental illness. Ayurveda uses a very comprehensive approach. We treat the body before we treat the mind. Cleansing the body is very, very important in mental illness. Tadasya shuddha dehasya prasadam labhade mana. Only when the body chemistry is clean and, you know, pure, the mind will become clean. Ahara shuddha sattva shuddhi. This is also a very important concept. If your physical body is not clean, then your mind will be disturbed. Correct the agni. After cleansing the body, bring dhadu balance because then there will be harmony of the tridoshas and then there will be enhancement of ojas. 
And when Ojas is abundant in the body, the Trigunas will come. Today we are talking about serotonin, you know, oxytocin, dopamine, endocannabinoids, endorphins, GABA, all these neurochemicals of happiness. If you look at their functions, they come very close to what Ayurveda calls as Ojas. Ojas happens when metabolism is, you know, completely balanced and perfect. An Ayurvedic strategy for mental health is Jnana, Vijnana, Dhairya, Smriti, Samadhi. And this is where we have the clear, uh, I'm making it very brief, that it is only by understanding the, spit, the root basis of the mind is consciousness. So Ayurveda says a mental illness can be ultimately removed and a person made healthy only by introducing the Dhairya, Atmadi, Vijnanam, Manu Param. That is where we need to link psychology to study of consciousness. Only then psychology will become complete. And once uh, when I was with a traditional Ayurveda Vaidya, he told me in Ayurveda there are four limbs of treatment, physician, medicine, attendant and patient. But in psychiatry, the fourth limb is society. This is very, very important. We have to, a, a mentally sick person cannot be considered as separate mind means integration so when you treat mental illness you have to integrate with the whole society with the whole family and love is the medicine for the mind to be a healer compassion is needed compassion is needed all the more to become a healer of the mind so psychology in indian tradition is codified in great spiritual traditions for this reason it remains undiscovered and dismissed as religion Rediscovering psychological knowledge in the spiritual traditions of India and Ayurveda can bring about a paradigm shift. Psychology will be subsumed in the study of consciousness and Atma Vidya will become the way to actually discover mental health and higher states of well-being. Namaste. Thank you, Dr. so much, Dr. Ram Manohar. It was so interesting that we didn't feel 30 minutes have passed actually. And your presentation raises many questions. In fact, I have many questions being a student of Indian philosophy, where a lot has been discussed about the nature and status of mind. But what you say, it is a bit different because in Indian philosophy, mind is not essentially the discussed in reference to consciousness. It is matter only. But I think I'll retain my questions and we'll discuss with you later on. I keep this floor open for discussion among the participants and the audience here. So anybody can raise questions and comments, please. Yeah, please, Professor Singh. Now at the outset, I have to thank two persons. Uh, first is the organization organizer of the seminar, uh, just sitting before me, a chairperson, who has not only planned but executed this workshop on Ayurveda with a passion. And the passion, uh, when combines with enthusiasm, it's a cutting edge, also is empowered. Uh, I am reminded of uh, Mr. Ghalil. Uh, he stands in a couplet. When you have unbounded passion, shauke beh iftiyar, so unbounded is passion is like that the cutting edge of the sword is even more enthusiastic. It moves beyond the sword to do its job. Just by be ikhtiyari shok dekha chahiye, sinai shamshir se bahar hai shamshir ka. So the, my next, uh, my rather profuse compliment to the speaker, Professor Amanohar, that uh, he has brought before us 
the acknowledged science of psychology versus our ancient science of the mind. Among the two fathers of psychology, Freud and his disciple and contemporary Carl Jung, both have taken great strides, but Carl Jung differed from his mentor later on when Carl Jung acknowledged this science of Veda in a monograph, Man in Search of Soul, he says that he treated many patients only, only, and only those were recovered whom spirituality had. I, I read out uh, the uh, paragraph. Carl Jung says, I have treated many hundreds of cases in the second of my in the second half of my life. There has not been one whose problem in the last resort was not that of finding a religious outlook on life. When Professor Ramano said that in Fire Veda in India, we have no conflict between science and spirituality. It is safe to say that every one of them fell ill because he had lost that which the living religions of every age have given their followers. And none of them has really been healed who did not regain his religious outlook. Therefore, our, it is a tribute to uh, our ancient uh, uh, knowledge of the mind, study of the mind, which the modern uh, psychologists have uh, profusely uh, acknowledged. And uh, last point uh, I will say that uh, Professor Ram Manohar has talked of that how Greed eats up your mind, if I have uh, understood him rightly. And greed is the source of all, all troubles. Uh, Gurbani in this respect says that material, material accumulation can never give oneself uh, the peace of mind or or healthy mind uh, by Gurdas uh, in Gurbani, uh, he is called his 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 Bani is called key of Gurbani. Gurbani the kunji is no kya jata hai. Wo kehte hai ke is uski ek pody hai uske mein bas do wo bolunga share. Bigde chatta dud da kanji di chukhe. इसमें जो जाल पंखेरु फास दे चुगण दी पुखे ग्रीड है जो चुगण दी पंची जाल में फस जाते हैं इसी तरह से त्यों अजर चाहक पंडार दी व्यापे बे मुखे जिस ने गुर मुख इसके उल्ट बे मुख है जो बे मुख बंदे है We have lost uh, the reality of life वो उनको जो खत्म करती है चीज अजर चाहक पंडार दी materials पंडार uncontrollable desire अजर चाहक तो uh, this uh, thing uh, I have all noticed with uh, this I uh, end that material all material uh, you can say gains they can bring us suhulat, but not sukh. This is, uh, I can say, and uh, uh, Dr. Ram Manohar, he has packed so much ideas in, in his such a brief 
presentation rather i felt it like a, a bombardment of great idea ideas thank you very much thank you professor singh professor ram manohar you may respond yes sir thank you uh, for those comments i didn't see any questions <laughs> uh in the in, yes I, I i just passingly heard the remarks of shashi prabhaji also that you know that i maybe sounded a bit different from the indian thinking but i i'd like to clarify that also that you know in ayurveda also mind and body make up the matter that is why i was mentioning it's mind and body is one continuum there is no split but why mind is not studied independently is because for the spiritual purpose of evolution manolaya man, man, mano buddhyo atmani samadhanam is what ayurveda defines as samadhi so that can happen only if we look at mind and its purpose in the light of a higher consciousness so instead of studying because if you study the mind separately we don't understand the purpose of what the why the mind exists the mind exists so that it can achieve that laya into the higher consciousness so only in that sense you know uh, I, uh, i said that we what we need is a science of consciousness and psychology will have its mind will fall into the right place when we look at it in the larger perspective of the higher consciousness and i'm very uh, thrilled to note the quotation made by uh, value yes value yes yes Karl and yeah. comes really very close to what ayurveda says that man dhi dhairi atmari vijnanam mano dosha ushadam param that unless you awaken to your higher spiritual reality you cannot really solve the problems of the mind thank you dr ram manohar although i am not yet convinced by what you say and because that is one point of view in indian tradition we have different points of view For so this is a healing healing perspective yeah. like psychology and psychiatry from the ayurvedic but, perspective but i would still urge upon you to kindly mention that india had a manovidya if not manah shastra there is a book prachina bharatiya manovidya written in sanskrit and because i am a student of vaisheshika the mind is held to be an instrument Hmm. an instrument between the body sense organs on one side and atman on the other side yeah. uh, manas plays double role it interacts with the mind I mean, with the body and sense body organs as well as, as well as the conscious yes. or the spirit and there are different perspective for example in sankhya it is different in buddhism it is different in jainism it is different but what you are saying that is the yoga perspective of mind i suppose But right but have... i have not come across any text or any shastra <clears throat> which calls itself as mano vijnan or mano vidya because all these I discussions can... are in the context of yeah i know of two so i will very much be happy to see such works and really re rethink about them thank you i think i don't think we have think more time for discussion Rohit like Rohit had raised his uh, hand for some time. I I think we have already crossed the time. If we have to keep trying, sorry, Rohit, you can raise your question as personally, or if we have time later on, because we have to go to the next speaker now, Dr. Suhas Kumar Shetty, and his topic is future leads for potentials of Ayurveda in mental health. I'll introduce him briefly. He is an Ayurveda practitioner, academician, researcher, and administrator who specialized in mental health research methodology and medical statistics with experience of over nineteen years. Currently, he is holding the post of principal and medical director at KLE Academy of Higher Education and Research, Sri. Kankanwadi Ayurveda Mahavidyalaya Belagavi he is also an adjunct faculty at Southern California University of Health Sciences California USA formerly he was professor and head department of manovijyan evam manas rog and dean college of ayurveda and hospital hasan india 
He is a member of many societies and academies. He is also principal and co-investigator of more than 12 research projects sponsored by various agencies. He is an internationally invited speaker in various conferences and workshops across the world. He has to his credit three books, more than 76 articles in various international peer-reviewed journals. He is recipient of various academic awards like Contingent Grant Award from CCRAS New Delhi, Pratibha Puraskar for Social Service in Treatment of Alcoholic Disorders and Paralysis, Bhishak 2018 Best Doctor Award, Teacher of the Year 2021 Award, Best Paper Presenter Award at various seminars and conferences, and he is a technical expert in various national and international policy documents and consultation meetings like WHO, CCIM, NCISM, CCRAS, etc. He specialized in mental health care consultation, clinical research, research methodology, and medical statistics workshops, examination and workplace stress management workshops, etc. I invite you, Dr. Suhas Kumar Shetty, for your presentation, please. Uh, very good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, once again, I'd like to thank you for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, I would like to uh, personally thank uh, Dr. Amanur and the entire team for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this conference being organized by Vivekananda International Foundation and uh, the research and the information systems of developing countries. In fact, would have been allowed to physically present there, but because of the bad weather, we had to stay online. But uh, anyway, uh, it's a great moment for all of us to share our ideas. And in fact, I would like to thank uh, Vaidya Ram Manohar for giving an, a very detailed and a very meaningful insight on the basics of uh, the psychology and how Ayurveda looks into psychology. And this becomes easy for me to talk in the applicability of how Ayurveda can look forward in the management of various mental health illnesses. Are the slides visible, ma'am? Yes, they are visible. Yeah, okay. So if you look at the, the shift that we had in the recent years in the healthcare expenditure as well as the disease profiles, we can see that Ayurveda can provide a golden opportunity to position as a treatment of choice for various non-communicable medical problems, including the mental health. So the real need that is important is that uh, we should see that mental health as a public health issue and various population related preventive as well as management problems can be taken. So how I will looks at the health is it talks about the physical component, it talks about the, the mental and the consciousness. So this is a part that already the Pramana has already covered that it is not a separate compartmental differentiation between the body and mind. In fact, it's always a continuum between the body and mind. And very importantly that we are talking about balance and equilibrium in terms of the, the physical components like the dosha, the heart, etc. And we're talking in terms of well-being, in terms of optimum mental health, in terms of what it causes sensory aspects or the mind as well as the consciousness. So Ayurveda also defines the mental health that it refers to the wellness of the object of sensory faculty, intellect, self and the mind and also the normalcy of the status of the husha and the dhatu. So mental health as you all know is defined as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her potentials and cope with the normal stresses of life and can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution 
to his community. So we look at the, the mental health issues that there were before the COVID or the pre-COVID era. As per the National Mental Health Survey in 2015-16, we could see that there were more than 10% of the people suffering with psychiatric morbidity, spanning from depression, anxiety, substance abuse, schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, insomnia, etc. And among which 0.8% was contributing to the major mental disorders like schizophrenia. So what we can make the differentiation of these psychiatric problems is that many times there is a lot of focus on the treatment of mental disorders, which could be common mental disorders or severe mental disorders. But where Ayurveda can really play a major role is at the people who are at the risk of developing the mental health disorders, who have been undergoing some form of distress and who are at the greater risk of developing some mental health issues in the later phase of their life. At the same time, it is equally important that we are taking care of our mental well-being by focusing on diet and lifestyle. And that is where Ayurveda can play a real contribution in the preventive psychiatry. At the same time, as per the National Survey and Extent and Pattern of Substance Abuse in India, which exactly is a very big issue, as per the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, we could see that there are more than 2.5 crores people in India who are dependent on alcohol and other substance abuse. So this can have a great impact on the, the society as an economic burden of the country. Even the upcoming problems of suicide, we can see that there are more than 1.5 lakh suicide conducted every year and almost like 381 to 400 completed suicide every day. If we look at the impact of the psychiatric morbidity of the mental health issues, we see that there is one in every six years is the years that is lost in disability because of mental health issues. More than 12 billion work days are lost because of mental health issues. And people die almost 10 to 20 years early because of mental health issues. So after the COVID, and if you look at the post-COVID era, you can see that the mental health issues definitely has become a great priority. The impact of the COVID has really put on a great overwhelming aspect of the whole life. It could be because of death of an individual, because of job loss, economic loss, and so on. There's a significant increase up to 25% in the people suffering with anxiety and depression after COVID. But though the responses are insufficient and inadequate, the, the focus is not much because less than 2% of the health budget goes to the mental health issues. So what is required is to scale up the treatment because mental health issues can cause a real economic crisis starting from the individual level to the global level. So where exactly is the gap? And especially in the developing country like India, there is a significant people because 70 to 86 percent of the people do not seek treatment. The problem could be because of the information gap, governance gap, resources available, accessibility, the services available to the people. So what exactly we need to do or in case of mental health is that consider this as a major health problem and see that it is a right of each and every individual to have an access to the better affordable mental health because this really determines the social economic development of any country so if you look at the health seeking behavior of in the mental health care people do not just as a physical problem the similar acceptance is not there for the psychological problems it could be because of various reasons like inadequate access non availability of medicines lack of health literacy and very, very important to the stigma and the discrimination that has always been related with the psychiatric problems. So exactly what we need to do is to have a different changes at the governance, advocacy, and very important, the political commitment, create more and more awareness. It's okay to suffer with mental disorders. It's okay to seek a mental health professionals and see that we are always there to help the individuals. So that's the reason why we need to reshape the mental health services where it can integrate the mental health with the general health care, investing in the community mental health care and strengthening the inf informal mental health care. And that is where we feel that the task shifting and the task sharing is very, very important. So the management or the services can be at various levels and very, very importantly, where Ayurveda can play a major role is about the self-care, the self-well-being, the different practices 
in terms of lifestyle, lifestyle, diet, the psychological well-being, the type of the the, the various uh, insights that is given in case of thoughts and emotions, and then of course in terms of the general hospital care as well as a psychiatric hospital care. What I feel as a practicing practitioner in psychiatry for the last two decades is that definitely we need to develop an access to the effective, affordable and quality mental health care. And where I can really contribute is in terms of the preventive psychiatry, because many times it is the uh, disease management, it is not a health management. We definitely need to invest on health. And definitely one more important area where it's gained that momentum is the nutritional psychiatry, where a lot of people say that because of the, the lifestyle disorders, because the present diet can cause various types of psychiatric disorder like anxiety, disorders, insomnia, depression, exactly. But the future will definitely belong to integrative psychiatry, where the best practices of the contemporary sciences, Ayurveda, uh, yoga, etc., can be brought together for the best care of the individuals. And of course, the use of technology, because people do not want to uh, talk to a physician, they won't would like to take the help of the, some act, technology, some form of uh, the apps are available, they are accessible, at least to screen their problems so that they can talk to the people and newer, newer type of technology can be used to uh, help people suffering with it. So what Ayurveda talks about and how we can offer the mental health for mental health issues. There's a beautiful quote which says that Nityam Hita Ahara Vihara Sevi Samikshakari Vishesh Vasaktaha Dataha Samaha Satyaparaha Shamavan Aptopa Sevicha Bhavantya Roga. Suppose you want to be physically and mentally fit and to take care of your well being, we need to involve in regular intake of balanced diet and physical exercises, being analytical, being sensory detached, being kind and helpful. There should be mental equanimity, truthfulness, and sense of forgiveness. And the respect for the elders and teachers will make a person away from all the physical and mental disorders. So that is why if you look at the various researches that are that are trending in the present and the future areas of psychiatry, we say that it's on the nutrition and diet, the role of exercises, relationship, relaxation, the various religious and the spiritual practices and involvement, and especially the contribution and the services to the society. Food as you no know, plays a major, major role in mental health. And food is not just what we're taking, it's not just the food, it's much beyond what we're taking from the environment. It could be for the body, it could be for the sense organs, it could be for the mind, as well as for the soul. The air, water, drink facilitates the body. The sensory objects, the external environment for the sensory pleasure or organs, the cognition and emotion for the mind, and the compassion and the forgiveness for the soul. So there are various foods which has been told as a cognitive enhancers, like water, ghee, gooseberry, raisins, Ash God. In one in the practice, also I recommend a lot of people to take the the juice, like around 50 ml twice daily for at least six weeks, can prevent the various types of psychiatric minor psychiatric disorders like depression, anxiety, insomnia, etc. Food can have a great impact on our mental health by modulation of the neurotransmitters. It can reuptake degradation synthesis receptor binding of the neurotransmitters and also the enhancement of cell membrane fluidity and the neurogenesis via upgradation of the brain derived neurotrophic. At the same time, physical activities is very important because physical activities, even including yoga, can exert or increase the academic performance, confidence, the mood, memory, positive well-being, as well as the, uh, the work efficiency of an individual. Working with the nature, because you can just imagine a therapy which do not have any side effects, but was readily available and could improve your cognitive functions. Because we are always staying in an artificial environment, that is why it causes disruption of the mood, sleep, and bi diurnal rhythms. One more big problem in the present era is the media immersion and hyper-reality, where there is a current explosion of the digital technology, not only is changing the way we are living, and communicating, but is also rapidly and profoundly changing our brains in the way we are thinking and acting. Of all the means that are procured by wisdom to ensure the happiness throughout the world of life, 
by far the most important is the care of the family and acquisition of friends. And this becomes very, very important for the people suffering with mental health issues. It could be the interdependent creatures, which accounts for almost one third of the outcome and variance. Recreation becomes very, very vital. And very importantly, the humor can appear to mitigate the stress, enhance the mood, and it sub also supports our immune system. So the yoga practice, pranayama, meditation practices can play a major role in relaxation and the stress management issues. And also it is said that those who attend religious services at least weekly tend to live approximately seven years longer than those who do not, because it gives you analyzes the importance of love and forgiveness and also to be away from punishment and guilt. Contribution not only supports the benefit, but also the giver and the receiver, because it enhances our happiness, mental health and spiritual spirituality. And that is where Ayurveda talks about all this code of conduct in the concept of Sadrutta, which talks about the mental well-being, spiritual well-being, emotional well-being, and see that a person is able to have a control over the self and so that he's able to lead a social, socially acceptable lives. So if you look at the recent uh, trending problems as per the practice that I've been doing, there's people suffering with a lot of suicidal issues because they're not able to accept the failures. And that is why a proper strong support system and the preventive aspect of mental health professionals can play a major role. Being, being able to available for the people who are able to need you when they are in trouble. Substance abuse, again, has been a great with problems because it not only affects the individual, but also the family and the society. That is why, again, preventing the people with substance abuse can make... Uh, we always had an opinion that the depression and anxiety were the problems of the adults and the old age. But as for the present practices that I've been seeing that there are a lot of young children, a lot of, lot of adolescents who have been suffering with various types of mental disorders. It is rightly said that more than 50% of the mental health issues start before the age of 14. And that is why probably creating awareness and the, stating the importance of mental health becomes very, very vital. There has been various newer issues like the electromagnetic hypersensitivity, the problems because of the usage of the mobiles, gadget, social media, where the people are getting suffered with various type of psychosomatic disorders. And these are the areas where Ayurveda can really play a major role. At the same time, thanks to COVID, that we are able to get a newer mode of care, that we are going for online teleconsultation. And this is one area where definitely we can play a very, very major role in the management of psychiatric disorders. When you talk of treatment, either in form of preventive health care, in psychiatry or the management of mental health issues, disorders, we feel that these are the four components which need to be taken into care. The diet, the lifestyle, the different therapies and medicines, and of course, the psychological support plays a very, very vital role. And that is where Ayurveda talks about a very comprehensive approach towards various types of mental disorders. Like it could be Daiva Vipasha Chikitsa, which are the faith-based spiritual treatments, the Yuktiya Chikitsa, which includes various rational and scientific therapies, and Sattva Chikitsa, which includes various types of counseling and psychotherapies. So these are the basic components or approach towards the management of psychiatric disorders. Various researchers have been taken of the role of mantra, meditation, money, homa, and how Prayash Chitta and going to the pilgrimage can play a very major role in the management of psychiatric disorders. There is various types of therapies, panchakarmas, various single herbs, herbal mineral preparations, which are found very, very beneficial in the management and they're very safe because patient, when they are coming to a psychiatric consultation in Ayurveda, they're already on medications. So it's equally important to have a knowledge of the contemporary science so that you can always know how to integrate at what level of vertical and horizontal integration can be made in the areas of psychiatric practices. And this is what, at the same time, we also at our university are trying to develop this model of integrative psychiatry so that we can really provide a better uh, outcome with the help and we are able to reach more number of people with minimal side effects. 
At the same time, I will talk about in detail about the, the principles of concepts of the counseling and psychotherapies. So to summarize, uh, based on the experiences of being managing various types of psychiatric disorders, I would like to just summarize the common conditions or how I do the approaches towards some of the common psychiatric disorders. Like various psychiatric disorders, especially the psychotic disorders, are described under the broad heading of Unmada. And again, when we categorize them based on the doshas, like Vataja Unmada, Pittaja Unmada, and Kafaja Unmada, we can see that we can use various types of uh, therapies as well as medications, like, like Musta, the Yapanabastita, Anima therapies, the purgative therapies, as well as emesis can be playing a role in Vataja, Pittaja, and Kafaja type of Unmada respectively. There are various ghee-based and alcohol-based, and it is very rational to use the ghee-based or lipid-based uh, preparations for the management of psychiatric disorders. As we know that it can cross the blood-brain barrier. At the same time, various types of asavarishtas also can be used in the management of psychiatric disorders. Various simple uh, formulations like Kalyanaka Gita, Kushmanda Gita, Panchagavra Gita are said to be beneficial in different spectrum, clinical spectrum of Kumara. At the same time, different types of uh, psychotherapies are also needed in psychotic disorders at a later phase of the therapies, like insight-oriented therapy, the family therapy, and the supportive psychotherapies. In case of epilepsy, again, it should be based whether it is on the acute management during the episode or after the treatment. Again, there are different types of therapies as well as different medications, like there is use of Brahmigrita, Vachadigrita, Smriti Sagararasa, and also we should always train to person to live with epilepsy. One more major issue is the insomnia, whereas the, the therapies like the Shirodhara using Shirabala Tela, Brahmi Tela can be playing a major role. And there are some preparations like Sarpa Gandavati, Mamsadi Kwata, Sastarishta. And very, very important what I've realized is the sleep hygiene techniques which need to be oriented to the patients. In case of substance abuse, especially the alcohol use disorders, there are a set of protocols which we have developed in terms of therapies and the treatments. And along with that, the cognitive behavioral therapy and the family therapies plays a very, very vital role. In case of anxiety disorders, again, the, the therapeutic purgation, as well as use of simple herbs like ashwagandha, tagara, brahmi, and various relaxation techniques, yogic techniques, practices can be very, very beneficial. In case of depression, use of Jyotishmati, Panchagavya Gritha, and Purana Gritha that is stored for more than one year. Again, a lot of research have been carried out in these areas where it is potential to use in various psychiatric disorders. And supportive psychotherapy, dynamic psychotherapy is, is very, very important. The most important is what the model that we commonly use in our practice, especially for creating awareness among the young generation is the ABCD. 4321 model for preventive mental health issues. A stands for away from distraction. B is better planning. C for being cheerful, enjoying the best part of the life. D for daily exercises. Four, four liters or ample quantity of water. Three times timely sattvic food. Two times of prayer or motivation and small dosage of yoga. And one recreation activity, which is going to keep an individual happy and healthy. If one practices this, truly we can see that mental health is the full expression of life. It is not just absence of a disease. So we should definitely go perfectly for the uh, granny mantras in terms of the food habits, exercise, social interaction, family support, and the care. So to conclude, though all these concepts are well documented, well evidenced, but still, there's definitely a lot of difficulties in implications because people always forget about the social importance of social support, little understanding of causal lifestyle causes, and people always feel that a, a passive expectation that the healing will come from outside authority or from a pill. You should always understand that for psychiatric disorders or mental illness, for, for every ill, there is no pill, but definitely there is, should be the will which can help the individual. The diet and lifestyle may need to be the central focus of the mental, medical, and public health in the future. 
So once again, I would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful opportunities. And I look forward for the interaction with the learned audience. Thank you. It is not audible, ma'am. Thank you so much for a very lucid and practical presentation, especially the last point that you gave ABCD 4321. I think this gives a very useful clue for curing mental health and for gaining perfect health. I now open this paper for discussion in the online joining members and also for the audience. Rohit, you can begin because uh, you couldn't ask the question last time. If you are there, please ask your question now. Um, I think the uh, one issue that I, as an observant uh, of uh, uh, this modern mental health, uh, like which is now a uh, buzzword, uh, I feel that uh, uh, it makes the feel it makes the patients feel odd about themselves in the first place by making them believe that they are patient and they are odd and uh, because they are suffering from a mental health. So the anxiety gets repeated because they are meditating on stress. All these negative words are being overstressed, I feel. So to come out of that, uh, I feel, as Raman also said, the uh, larger idea of consciousness might positively help to come out of that loop down the line like the the beginning of the uh, the mental illness could be because of some death in the family or some traumas but after a while the idea that uh, they are a patient itself will become the reason for their stress and anxiety when this disease will get over that sort of a thinking will continue so uh, the, uh, i mean that was my comment for uh, ramana uh, presentation and uh, uh, my question for Ramanor sir was uh, the, the portion where he mentioned on uh, uh, Vata, Pitta and Kapha, where Vata is uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, related to fear and uh, uh, Pitta is related to anger, if, if I remember it correct. But Kapha is uh, related to something that is positive, which is indifference, he mentioned. So, uh, like... Is it that uh, uh, my, uh, like Kapha is more of a positive kind of a, a guna according to Ayurveda in comparison? Like we say is in the, the Bhagavad Gita. So is the Prakna person is more likely to have a Kapha Vata? I mean Kapha guna. Is that what we should make out of it? Yes, um, I'll come to straight to that question. <clears throat> See, uh, if you look at the three prakritis, the kapha prakritis mental attributes are generally considered to be more favorable. It's said to be a sattvic person, you know, more stable and all that. But if kapha is, wish, is disturbed, here I have certain opinions. It may not be, everybody may not have accepted it. I have uh, studied, uh, tried to study this very deeply. Kapha, when it is dushta, it can also produce negative results. Because I have found that what we call as depression today is more of a kapha kind of, you know, uh, expression. Sorrow is is vata because you can look at two types of expression of sorrow. Somebody who is uh, sad may make a big, uh, you know, tantrum out of it, uh, shouting, crying, see, I am sick. This is a vata expression. But if a kapha person, due to the disturbance of kapha, somebody gets into depression, then they become withdrawn. So that withdrawal behavior is more tamasic and kapha related. Whereas a vata person with the same sorrow, a vata expression would be more you know, active. They will go around uh, lamenting their problem and uh, things like that. So kapha in its positive attribute is supposed to make the person more uh, happy, more stable, and yeah, but it can also have a negative expression. Does that answer your question? 
Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ram Manohar. Any further questions, queries, or comments? Can I please comment, uh... express. Yeah, please. Yeah, Dr. Gupta, so, please. So I think uh, very interesting uh, presentations both. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ramanur's uh, uh, take on uh, the uh, psychological aspects. There's no psychiatry or psychology in uh, Ayurveda. It's about consciousness. Psychiatry is there. Psychiatry is there. Psychiatry is there. Okay, no psychology. No, yeah. my short point is that what you said, and also to Shetty Sahib, is this being discussed with the uh, other side, that is the uh, allopathic side or the uh, you know, the modern uh, so-called traditions of, is there some discussion, dialogue taking place? Because what you seem, both of you seem to suggest is a much broader framework and probably a much better and complete framework of dealing with these issues than what the uh, psychiatric or psychological treatments which are prevalent. Is there a dialogue? So fast you can answer. Yeah, yes. definitely, sir. I think uh, in one of my side, I was just giving the model of the integrative psychiatric practices uh, where we are trying to uh, integrate with the, all the systems. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, based on the experiences that, because many times what happens is patient when they approach, they are already on medications, like uh, very commonly antidepressants, antipsychotics, or mood stabilizers. And uh, Many times it is not because of the medicines, because of the side effects also they suffer. But in some condition, definitely they would definitely need uh, the uh, usage of the, some of the uh, medicines that is there in the allopathic system. But what we can definitely do is to see that how we can integrate. And that is where how maybe reduce or uh, there are guidelines to taper the medicines, add on with the Ayurvedic medication, therapies, yoga. Like for example, if you look at the schizophrenia, Schizophrenia has two components. Like, for example, there are positive symptoms and there are negative symptoms. For positive symptoms, we can take the help of antipsychotics. For negative symptoms, Ayurveda and the yogic science plays a ma major role. In case of the many of the mild to moderate conditions, we may not need medications. We may help, uh, take the help of some uh, like diet, lifestyle, and some uh, uh, herbal preparations which are quite safe can be used in very mild to moderate conditions. So that is why, and at the same time, if we're able to uh, uh, come together, have a close dialogue, again, uh, it is not happening at the scaling up magnitude that is really required at the global level. But there definitely there has been good amount of people who are coming forward to have this collaborations. And in fact, we have this OPD of integrative psychiatry OPD, where in fact, the Nimans also has developed a model where they have the three experts from allopathy, Ayurveda, and yoga in their integrative medicine uh, department, where they are developing the uh, this model and also generating the evidence for this. So the years to come definitely will belong to you no know, like sabka saath, sabka vikas. No, it's like the integrative practices of all the systems coming together in the best interest of the people. That will be definitely the future. So there are some works, but not to the level of depth that it should happen. First. Yes, if I may just very briefly mention some engagements with modern psychiatry and like <clears throat> both at in India and abroad. Now, I've been engaged with this group based in Pondicherry who are trying to bring this Indian perspective on psychology. Matthias Cornelis and Anand Paranjave, Professor Ramakrishna Rao. And so in that, there are a lot of modern psychiatrists. I won't say it has yet become mainstream, but this engagement has already started. And I have been able to present my perspective there and many discussions and debates are going on. I'm also involved with uh, a professional psychiatrist from the University of Milan, Italy, Dr. Antonella Delle Fave, and she's especially, you know, engaged with uh, happiness studies, studies on consciousness. And I've also had the opportunity to uh, discuss and I find a lot of openness, but I think this needs, to, it has to reach a kind of momentum and critical mass before it can make an impact. But uh, the seeds are already sown. Thank you, Dr. Ram Manohar and Dr. Shetty. Any more questions? Uh, 
or comments if i can, if I can come once again yeah please um uh, ma'am one major uh, business that modern psychology has is the field of consultation like lot of individuals go and uh, consult people for healing they discuss their problems with the doctors um likewise if we are to produce such consultation facility through the knowledge of ayurveda it could be very difficult because uh, at the larger point as ramanor sir mentioned there is atma gnana at the end of it so uh, we cannot uh, train people to have atma gnana we should need people who just uh, you know who, who are immersed in knowledge to come out with so many of the modern psychological people who are consulting they themselves might ha be having uh, like mental issues and ev everything so uh, like how do we encounter this problem like if at all we want to uh, make consultants uh, uh, in ayurveda for yeah, mental health yeah. dr ram manohar or dr shetty yeah i think so it's a very good question you know uh, from what i have understood as i was mentioning i used that word love and compassion which i learned from a traditional psychiatry in kerala we had a tradition of the only tradition of psychiatry that survived in india is in kerala there is a family called pungudil mana and i had the opportunity to interview the main physician there when i was a student and that is what he said he said this thing that it's it's not necessary it's you see what is spirituality it's developing this compassion and love for everyone so he explained it as that love and empathy which is something which we have to incorporate into this whole training because atmajnana formally reading a lot of vedanta or uh, yoga doesn't really bring that empathy in you unless you have empathy you cannot heal so in a mind mental <clears throat> disease that empathy or love if you cannot love your patient you know you cannot really bring about a change in any mentally ill person whatever techniques you have this is what he very clearly said that love is the primary medicine and if you if you want to become a psychiatrist that's what he told me you should have the capability of loving everybody otherwise you cannot become a psychiatrist and otherwise you you yourself may become a mentally sick person because the stress of dealing with a mentally sick person is tremendous i mean many psychiatrists have challenges you know facing this problem yeah, to just add on to what dr amano has said so basically no it is said that the mental health professionals especially the psychiatrist are under tremendous stress and the highest number of the suicide by the mental health professionals are by psychiatrist so you can just imagine the type of impact that it can have on uh, a treating psychiatrist so that is why the self care becomes very very vital and the most important way how we can take care of it is that is what uh, in case of bhagavad gita i said as abhyasa and vairagya are the two very important things or the concept which makes a person able to be away from such problems and uh, personally i also feel that there are two uh, important things no that how we can take care of our mental health is to not take the things very personally and to not overreact for anything It becomes very very vital so one uh, when we are not overacting to the circumstances or the situations and when we are not taking things personally and taking the best of that which can be applicable for the self can play a very very uh, major role and that is why probably you no know, and the whole world there is our family vasudeva kutumbakam and that is why having that uh, care for the entire family or entire world and that's what dr ramon was stressing upon becomes very very vital so this are few my of my input from my side thank you deepak kapoor ji you have a question deepak kapoor ji i think he is not online any more questions yeah please ठीक 
Thank you, madam. No question at all. Very nice uh, and grossing session. Kudos to you, uh, madam, for the for organizing this. Really uh, a stunning uh, ovation to you and your organizers. All the best. Thank you. Uh, can I come in for a minute? Can I come in? Am I audible? Say Chauhan, sir. Yes, Namaste. Namaste, <coughs> Chauhan. We are looking forward to listen to you in the next yeah. session. But you have a intervention or come question? Yeah, yeah. Just, just, uh, just okay. intervention on this because this is one of my favorite subjects. And originally, I was thinking I will, I will be a speaker in this category. So one of the concept in when we talk about uh, psychology or uh, man, man, mental health that is still missing in Ayurveda and in some of the philosophical schools is the concept of chitta. So when we talk about the subtle body, which is very prominently you know, involved in the mental uh, disturbance and the mental diseases, there is uh, this uh, concept of antakaran chatushta, which is manas, buddhi, ahankar and chitta. So, you know, uh, in the mental disorders, the problem is not only residing in the mind, you know, it's the, the problem is actually residing in the chitta. And until and unless we have protocols to work on the chitta, to what we call, you know, we have, we have in Jiva, we have created a protocol, it's called the chitta shodhan therapy. And uh, this is primarily because people who are suffering from mental disorders, they have so much emotional traumatic experiences in their life which they are not able to metabolize or digest or, you know, let go. So that is one area. And another area in the mental health that we have, we are also doing very successfully, even with patients who are suffering in the physical body, like for example, even diabetic patients, many of them have diabetes because of emotional traumatic experiences. So if we don't go to the root cause, so we have a mind well-being coach on our board, which we have a wonderful training program. And, uh, you know, in Ayurveda, we do have mention of all these things like Sattva Vajaya Chikitsa. So they do talk about various things, but I think it was not elaborated by our uh, ancient rishis at that time because it was not needed. In those, those era, people were like all sattvic people. They were all mentally very relaxed. Everybody was practicing yoga. But in today's context, it becomes very important. We have to really... Uh, you know, re-look re into our Shastras, not only Ayurveda, we have to look into various, you know, uh, our Vedic literatures. And you will, be, I have uh, compiled some, some nice course on Vedic psychology where I have taken things from different, even Bhagavad Gita or Bhagavatam and many other places. So uh, I think that there is a need to compile all this uh, knowledge from different Shastras and create a model that will be, you know, more logical, rational, if to say so, and will be practical in, 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 uh, in terms of application and effective in terms of the outcome. So this is just a comment because uh, I work in this area. So I just wanted to make a comment. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chauhan. I go back to Professor Singh. Uh, I see that uh, every scholar uh, supports uh, um, some kind of uh, integration between the two systems, as one of the scholars had pointed out, that uh, if uh, uh, an Ayurvedic well, uh, doctor wants to treat a person coming from um, the taking medicine from the other discipline, uh, it is better if uh, he he is the, the system, the allopathy or any other the drugs or medicines he is taken, uh, if he is uh, familiar with that, it uh, it will be he will be, he will be in a better position uh, to to treat him. Uh, my mind was actually uh, that uh, transported back uh, to the medical system of uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh. Um, there is one uh, the innovative way which he had employed. His department at Lahore was under the uh, in charge of a minister, and he had established besides dispensaries spread over all the state. There was a big hospital, 
and uh, it has uh, it uh, it uh, it had three different uh, chambers in which uh, doctors of three disciplines sat: uh, Yunani, Ayurvedic, and um, uh, the European. Because why the European section was uh, taken care of by his own uh, physician uh, Honishberger. And all the three departments, they were joined by an interior chamber where a surgeon uh, used to sit. And persons from, uh, yeah, patients from all the, uh, you can say, disciplines, they were uh, uh, referred to surgery uh, in, in cases they, they needed it. And uh, a doctor from one discipline uh, was also yeah, you can say sometimes uh, spoke to the doctor from other discipline to have a better view uh, of uh, uh, his approach towards curing the patient. Uh, such uh, a practice can, I think, be followed that uh, uh, some hospitals can be where, where interaction between the doctors of two disciplines is possible to some extent. Rather, it should be encouraged. If, um, that's all. Dr. Shetty, would you like to respond? Dr. Ram Manohar or Dr. Shetty? Yeah, I think I already have mentioned about the, yeah. the, the yeah. integrative psychiatry practices. I think that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we have hearing since we have been hearing since yesterday about this integrative medicine, collaborative treatment. So this is the time for integrating all these systems because we cannot do away with allopathy in modern times. But we have to integrate the basic principles of Ayurveda for a better life, for a better health, and for a better humanity. That is the theme of this conference, Ayurveda Holistic Science for Well-Being of the World. So, well-being of the world being our aim, we should try and integrate all these systems to the best of our capacity. Coming to the issue of Indian psychology, the psychology was not there, but the discussion about mind was profoundly done in several systems of Indian philosophy, right from the Veda. In Yajur Veda, we have a full Shiva Sankalpa Sukta. We have several statements which indicate auto suggestions. From Rig Veda, we have Paro Pehi Manas Papa Kima Shastani Shansasi. Somebody is calling his or her own mind. Why are you bringing evil ideas? Go back and don't disturb me. Paro Pehi Manas Papa. So, there is a dialogue with mind, manaha, although that mind is not the same as it is being discussed in modern psychology, because in Vedic philosophy, mind is a complete unit of consciousness as well as cognition. Both of these activities are assigned to mind, but we have to have the study of Indian psychology and in deep and maybe there is an occasion later on. With these comments, we move on to the next session now. And the next session is. This is preventive and predictive medicine. And the next speaker for us is Dr. Pratap Chauhan, Director Jiva Ayurveda, Faridabad, Haryana. His topic is Preventive and Predictive Medicine and Ayurvedic Perspective. I'll read out his introduction. Director of Jiva Ayurveda, Dr. Chauhan is a world-renowned Ayurveda Acharya, author and public speaker, TV personality, and the only Ayurvedic doctor honored with the prestigious World Summit Award by the United Nations. Since 1992, he has dedicated himself to popularizing Ayurveda across the world. He started the world's first Ayurvedic website and a telemedicine center 
that consult 8,000 patients daily. Author of two best-selling books, Eternal Health and Eternal Beauty, and dozens of videos on various health problems, he teaches Ayurveda to students worldwide. Dr. Chauhan has traveled to more than 42 countries to spread the knowledge of Ayurveda and is a visiting faculty at many international universities. And as he mentioned himself just now, that he has started a course on Vedic psychology. So, Dr. Chauhan, it's your time now for preventive and predictive medicine and Ayurvedic perspective. Thank you very much, madam, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this wonderful uh, you know, conference where I am seeing a lot of people with very good ideas, great ideas. Originally, I was thinking I was I, I was speak I will speak about mental health, but uh, a couple of days ago, I was told that my category is preventive and predictive medicine. So, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but I'll just speak and uh, try to explain the preventive medicine, especially preventive medicine in Ayurveda. Uh, we all know that Bharat is the land of uh, yoga and Ayurveda. Uh, we are all very proud that our GDP is growing very nicely, but unfortunately our health index and especially our happiness index is going down. And this is a little bit, uh, you know, sad situation that being a land of not only just yoga and Ayurveda, but many other uh, philosophical schools, great schools that talk about, you know, different aspects of the human uh, well-being, we are still not able to utilize this knowledge. And uh, very recently, you might have seen that there was a report that was uh, submitted by ICMR that our, uh, India is now become the diabetic capital. There are 10 crore patients of diabetes. There are 13 crore pre-diabetic patients. And unfortunately, the, the rise in diabetes in last four or five years has been like 35% uh, percent new cases have come in. So, you know, this is something with which we need to understand because I'm going to talk about more about prevention. So where is the, uh, where have we gone wrong in this uh, whole concept of preventing the disease or spread of the disease, especially the lifestyle diseases where Ayurveda plays a very important role because Ayurveda is called the science of lifestyle. You know, it's all talks about lifestyle and different things. So this the root cause, which I always understand is that we have disconnected from Ayurveda. We have been doing many things in our life. There's a lot of progress happening, but somehow we have forgotten our own roots and that's what we need. We need to reconnect with Ayurveda. A lot of people recently, especially after COVID, have started you know, living a healthy lifestyle. They have changed their diet. They're doing also some yoga, pranayam, meditation is becoming very popular. But still, you know, it's very, very important that we need to create some you know, proper protocols and proper programs, which is based on Shastra. I say Shastra because Shastra is the Praman. According to our Vedic tradition, Shastra, whatever is mentioned in our Shastras, it is already like a proof. And uh, because we talk about evidence and all those things very much these days, in our Vedic knowledge systems, uh, all the Shastras that are there, they are considered as Praman and they are considered as proof. Now, talking about Ayurveda as a preventive medicine or predictive medicine, I would say Ayurveda is not only preventive and predictive. Ayurveda is also personalized and participatory medicine. Recently, there is a concept of P4 medicine. You might have heard in the modern medicine, there is a new paradigm emerging, which is called the P4 medicine. So let me just explain to you that Ayurveda is actually the original P4 medicine because in Ayurveda, we talk about prevention. We, we do have a, a part of Ayurveda that helps us to predict diseases. Ayurveda is very much a personalized healthcare system and it's participatory. As I think Dr. Ram Monor was also explaining that there are four limbs of Chikitsa. Chikitsa, which is treatment when we treat the patient, the patient himself is also involved in this whole process of treatment, which is like he needs to participate in this process. So therefore, Ayurveda is a P4 medicine, I can say. And not only just 
preventive, predictive, or per personalized. Ayurveda also has a very, very systemic, uh, systematic uh, curative, you know, protocols for various diseases. There are eight specialized branches that deal with different types of diseases. And there is also a promotive part of Ayurveda, which is more dealing with re rejuvenation and which we can call in the modern language as immunity boosters or, you know, immunomodulators, or we can say anti-aging programs. So Ayurveda has that part also. Today, my focus is primarily going to be on prevention. And if we look at the, the main goal of Ayurveda, which says swasthasya swastha rakshanam aturasya vikar prashamanuncha. So even in the prime goal of Ayurveda, the aim of Ayurveda, which is called the prayojana of Ayurveda, it is mentioned swasthasya swastha rakshanam. This is the first goal, which means that Ayurveda focuses first on uh, prevention, which is called maintaining the health of those who are already healthy. And there is a lot of description around this subject in Ayurveda which we need to actually in this time, at, at this current time, we need to also understand that we need to create protocols, programs, not only just for the individual level, but at the community level, also at the level of the government. I think we need to int integrate all these wonderful programs, which are very easy to understand, very easy to practice. They are very effective. They are practical programs, which I'm going to share some of those I will share with you during my talk today. And of course, uh, uh, as I mentioned, when it comes to treatment, that's not the subject today, but there are also very, very, very nice protocols which can be independently used and which can also be integrated with other medical systems. So when we talk about prevention, so the first thing that comes to uh, our, our, you know, this Ayurvedic, Ayurveda suggest is Dhinacharya. Dhinacharya, you might have heard, you know, this is a very simple word which simply means daily routine but if you really go a little bit deeper and try to understand what is the basic fundamental principle how does dinacharya helps us to remain healthy how can dinacharya you know prevent diseases it works on a simple principle of rhythm if you see in our body and even in the mind or in the whole system the whole system works in a rhythm Rhythm is health, we can say. When our heart is beating in a rhythm, lungs are in a rhythm, they are expanding and contracting, peristalsis movement, you know, release of hormones. You see every everything in this body is working in a complete rhythm. Whenever this rhythm is broken, that is called a disease. And what is treatment? When, we, when patients come to us, we are trying to bring you back into the rhythm which is called the, there is a word for that is sama sama means balance so dinacharya because it is a set of some simple simple you know programs that we we do from morning till night it is a, a program that helps our system to become in sync with the rhythm of the body it's like a resonating program and in resonance there is a sync so there are programs like what time you should wake up, what, what, what you should do, what type of, you know, morning activities, what you should, what should you be doing at your job, evening program. And in the, of course, there's a night, night program, very easy program, which anybody can practice. You don't have to do too many changes in your, uh, you know, in your current routine, just add small things and you can always do it at your own pace. It's not necessary that you have to make some very drastic change in one day. You can small start with small changes. In modern terminology, also you might have heard of circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms are physical, mental, and behavioral you know, changes that follow a 24-hour cycle. So these natural processes respond primarily to the light and the dark outside. And this is what Ayurvedic Dhinacharya is all based on. So this is one of the first thing that when I talk about prevention, we should definitely look into this process. And as I mentioned that circadian rhythms are also connected with the outer environment. So then Ayurveda also changes the dinacharya in different seasons according to season because outer environment changes. So then we make, need to make some changes according to season, which is called Ritucharya. So no matter how 
how much health conscious you are or you know how much you follow a diet or a lifestyle ayurveda still suggests that even then our doshas vata pitta kapha get accumulated even during different parts of the day they increase and decrease during different seasons so therefore another very very important protocol for prevention that ayurveda suggests is what they call the seasonal cleansing program which is called the panchakarma program very very uh, important for prevention if you want to really stay healthy and uh, stay young and stay happy also because we're talking about body mind uh, paradigm here so we need to follow regular panchakarma seasonal panchakarma it's like you know if you have a car when your car is running properly there's no problem with the car still you take the car for servicing so it's a similar concept that this is the car we are working work, keep we are driving this car every day and there are some toxins which get deposited naturally so they need to be cleaned so now you know what is the what is the take away from this dinacharya program i think what we can do is we should we should think about it we have quite a few people here who work with policy and also their you know great think tank in this in this group here so we need to cre create some program based on dinacharya and ritucharya especially in our schools and we must involve the parents also in this program it's not only for the children for example we run a school in faridabad is called the jiva public school and dinacharya is a part of the curriculum here and it's bringing great results also we should introduce this dinacharya program especially to the corporate people you know last i think last year or two years ago the ayush ministry had introduced what they call the y break the yoga break in many corporates so i think similar programs we need to introduce in our corporate and our other offices so that people it's this not complicated as i said they are very simple programs simple things you have to just like you know in the morning you wake up drink some water go to toilet maybe before taking a bath apply some oil apply oil in your nose ear simple things some stretching exercises which can be very easily done at the job for example you can always stand up do some stretching drink some water avoid certain types of foods so these protocols are simple they can be but the need is we need to just popularize them we need to take some decisions that they should be implemented another concept which is very very important in prevention in ayurveda and which of course we may be knowing some part of it is what is called the three upastamba the three upastamba they are called the three supporting pillars of health it is considered that the human system is you know is a, like a tripod body mind soul these are three main main categories which are related to our well being our health and then there are three supporting pillars for the three pillars and these are ahar nidra and brahmacharya so again food is very very important we all know that if you want to be healthy and they always say food is your medicine and food can be your preventive medicine also so food is the diet that we eat of course lot of people are now very conscious about diet some people are eating vegan diet some people are eating macrobiotic there is ketogenic diet lot of intermittent fasting many many people are doing this but what we are missing you know when we say ahara in ayurveda it is not only what you are eating it's very important to also look into how you are eating it when you are eating it these are called the eating rules how much you are eating and also how it is prepared how is the processing done there's so much processed food we are eating these days junk food which is one of the prime cause of our diseases so ayurveda also talks about cooking also processing the cooking place how the cooking place should be the utensils used for cooking and also the person who is cooking it's very important who is cooking the food what are the mental and emotional situation of that person even physically is he clean or not and also the person who is eating this food is also the, this person also has to follow certain rules and regulations and very important in ayurveda is what we call the food combinations the concept of incompatible food viruddha ahara so much of viruddha ahara we are eating we must be eating the organic or the best quality food but are we really mixing the right things together or we are mixing viruddha ahara you know it taking viruddha ahara 
So that is going to be a cause of disease. That's why many times we have patients, you know, who are doing everything right. They say, I'm eating a very clean diet, organic food, and I'm not eating too much, but there is a concept of virud ahara. And another concept is that you could be eating the best food and good quality of food, proper quantity of food, but the food is not according to your prakriti. This concept in Ayurveda is also very important for prevention. If you want your doshas to be in balance, if you want your dhatus, your tissues to be good quality, it is very important that you eat according to your prakriti. Every person has a unique prakriti, unique constitution of the vata pitta kapha, the dominance of the doshas. And based on your prakriti, you have to choose your food, the right food. Not only food, there's many other things you can choose based on your prakriti. You can choose your lifestyle, your exercise, your clothing style, even your partner, even your job, you can choose according to your prakriti so that you don't have mental depression, anxiety when you go to the job. So this is one. And when we say ahara in Ayurveda, it's not what you're eating from your mouth. Ahariyati iti ahara. Anything that is going in is your food. So for the mental health prevention, very important, we say jaisa khao an, vesa bane man. So you have to be very careful what you are eating from mouth, what you are eating through your eyes, what you are watching, what you are hearing, what you are reading, what kind of you know environment you are living in, and of course, who are the people with whom you are associating. Your sangat is very, very important. So again, if we see what is the takeaway from this part, uh, if for, for our preventive uh, medicine, I think it is very important that we have to create prakriti-based food charts, what to eat and what not to eat. And this should be included in school curriculum. It should be somehow maybe we can create an app for this and general people can be introduced to this concept. And I'm sure that this is going to curtail a lot of diseases, especially the so-called lifestyle diseases. Also very important, which we have also experimented in our school is that creating some sattvic recipes, delicious recipes for the school canteens. If you go to the school canteens these days, most of it is junk food. So it's creating a disease already there. So for prevention, this will be a very important thing. Now coming to the second upastamba, which is called nidra or sleep. Nidra or sleep is called the diet of the mind. If you want mental health, good health, even for the body, sleep is very important. And now we know from modern medicine also that there are so many diseases which are caused by sleep deprivation or irregular sleeping habits. You are sleeping late in the night. Some people go to bed at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock sometimes and sometimes you know, born early morning. So all these things, they lead to mental disorders like anxiety, depression, delusion, so many diseases. Of course, when the mind is not healthy, when mind is not relaxed, because you're not getting good sleep, then your gut also gets disturbed. So there is a brain-gut connection and healthy mind, healthy, unhealthy mind will also lead to uh, some kind of hormonal imbalances. So there is a lot of problems with sleep today and long-term lack of sleep can also cause obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases. Now, what is, what is the solution? Very simple, I have created a protocol, simple, like a 20 minute protocol that you can do every night uh, if you want to go to bed and have a nice sleep. At least, you know, fix a time for, uh, right time for going to bed. I, I always suggest 10 o'clock is a good time. Early to bed, early to rise, is, we all know this makes a person healthy, wealthy and wise. So, uh, and at least 45 minutes before you have the time to sleep, you must switch off all your gadgets. No stimulation is required. And if, then what you have to do in this time, soak your feet in warm water for 10 minutes. You can, if you want, you know, massage your feet. Of course, you can put in your room some very nice soft music, some instrumental music. You can also use some aroma. And when you go to bed, either do a 10, 15 minutes meditation or you can do a shavasana. Very nice to put you into sleep. On the side, you can put like om chanting or some sleep music is very good. This is the thing which will make you fall asleep, you will sleep very well. Again, these kind of programs should be converted into some protocols. They should be taught to mainly to the corporate, you know, people who have a lot of stress or any other offices where people have stress. Remember one thing, stimulation is not relaxation. 
you know, many people, they drink alcohol in the night so that they can sleep well or they're watching something. So this is stimulating your brain and that's not going to help you sleep. Even if you'll sleep, your sleep is not very sound and it's very disturbed. Now, third upastamba, very, very important, which often people don't pay much attention is called brahmacharya. What is brahmacharya? What does it mean? So I translated this as not celibacy, but brahmacharya means ethical and regulated sexual indulgence. It's very important. Ethical is very, very important. Regulation is very important because according to Ayurveda, when you are indulging in sexual activities, you are losing a very prominent tissue, dhatu, is shukra dhatu. And shukra dhatu is connected with all other dhatus. If you lose too much of shukra, all dhatus, all tissues will become weakened. And of course, the most important, your ojas will be depleted. And when ojas is depleted, your mental stamina, your mental strength will be low. And most important, why brahmacharya is needed is for your spiritual well-being. You might have seen that people who take to some spiritual kind of life, when they become a sannyasi or they become, you know, some kind of a viragi, uh, brahmacharya is a very prominent part of this, which means that in order to understand the absolute, it's important to, you know, be brahmacharya or to at least to understand, to retain your shukra dhatu, to preserve your shukra dhatu. And spiritual health, of course, is very, very important. Of course, these days, we all know that we are we are very much after our body and mind but the real real problem is that i am not body i am not mind i am the soul and this is the purpose of human life is to actually realize this that i am soul i am eternal i am full of bliss i am full of love and this is a very very important thing because in in yoga there is a concept of avidya Avidya is the root cause of all diseases. Our suffering is because of avidya and the avidya is that I am this body. Avidya leads to asmita and then it leads to raga, attachments and diversions which is raga and dvesha. And finally, we have abhinivesha which is called the fear of losing this body which is the biggest disease in the world today. So now, what is the, what is the takeaway from all this uh, description is that what I, I can say briefly is that you have to identify identify very, very importantly who you are. Your true identity is very, very important both for prevention as well as for treatment of diseases. Because if you don't know who you are, then you are living in an identity crisis. You are actually living in avidya. And avidya here does not mean ignorance. Avidya means wrong knowledge. And your whole foundation is on this wrong knowledge which will fall apart anyway one day. So it's like you're trying to drive a car, this is a car, but you're not situated in the driver's seat. You're sitting in the back seat and trying to drive. That's why so many people have stress. And many people, they're not even sitting in, inside, they're outside always, on the Facebook, on social media. So it's like you're pushing your car from the outside. So please try to understand these three upastambhas are very, very important in brief, nutritious and easily digestible food, good sound sleep, and ethical and regulated sexual indulgence. All these are needed for preservation and prevention of health. If one of these is missing, definitely it is going to cause diseases. Another concept in Ayurveda when we talk about prevention is what we call the Shadvid Kriya Kal. I am not going to go into details, but I just want to explain to you that there is a beautiful description of Ayurveda in Ayurveda of how the diseases are manifested. Diseases are not manifested in one day. There are six stages. There is accumulation of doshas, then there is aggravation, then the doshas will spread to different parts. They will relocate. These four stages are the stages where the disease symptoms have not manifested yet. The disease has not manifested yet. So therefore, this is the window where we can come in and we can do prevention. And simple, you know, principle here is what we call in Ayurveda is Nidan Parivarjan. If you can identify, like if you have a little bit of burning, it's not yet hyperacidity, just a little burning in your stomach. So what you can think that Pitta, some fire has increased. So Ayurveda says, stop the similar, take the opposite. Because like increases, opposite decreases. This is the rule. So Shadvid Kriya Kal is a very, very important, you know, prominent program in Ayurveda that can help us to, you know, just not let the disease manifest itself. So again, what, what we can, how can we use this program? 
we can create such program based on diet, exercise, herbs, some home remedies for simple aggravation of doshas and we can also create some simple remedies that can arrest the progress of the disease and manifestation process of the disease. So this will be very nice, you know, prevention program. And let me share with you that in Japan, I'm working with the one prefecture, Kanagawa, I have meeting with them. They have created such program. It's called Mibio, Mibio program. So it's the, it's the time window from the onset of the sim, some, some kind of imbalance till the manifestation of disease. And what they do is just some yoga, some exercise, some kind of herbs they're using to just arrest the disease, prevent the disease. So this is again a very, very important part of Ayurveda. Again, when we want to go into prevention, Ayurveda talks about different levels of prevention. One is that what we call pre-prevention program. In modern medicine, they call it like primordial prevention. It is the earliest prevention uh, which is primarily aiming to prevent children from having diseases. But in Ayurveda, we have a beautiful concept of even the fetal care, pregnancy care, preconception. There is a beautiful description of how both partners should before conception prepare themselves. We have a program in Jiva, it's called the Ayur Baby program. Very nice program. In Ayurveda, it is called the Garb Sanskar program. And there is a monthly regimen which is called the Masanumasik postnatal care and after the child is born, Swaran Prashan is a very, very important prominent program for building the immunity of the child. So what I'm trying to say here is that we have wonderful concepts which are all practiced. They are all tested. There's no need to do any trials on this and this should be promoted. I suggest that Garb Samskar Masanumasik training should be given to the young would-be parents who want to have children. Also, uh, like I said, we have this program, Ayur Baby. I think already thousands of people from all over the world have taken this program. Garab Sanskar and Masanumasik training should be given to the midwives maybe or in the primary healthcare workers in the village level, Anganwadi, you know, we can train them. This will, this will definitely curtail this so much, you know, outcome of uh, outburst of diseases. Swarn Prashan program can be launched in a big way. I think government should launch this program like they launched this polio, polio drops program was introduced. So this is what is in Ayurveda is called pre-primary prevention. Then there is primary prevention and primary, primary prevention is mainly, you know, trying to work either with the set of population or individual. The pur purpose of primary prevention is to prevent disease from occurring. There's no disease. It's like, you know, before the disease has occurred. Again, what Ayurveda can do here is Ayurveda talks about foods, lifestyles, herbs, according to your prakriti. Ayurveda advises, advises personalized diets, lifestyles, all the what we call exercises, seasonal regimen, dinacharya, ritucharya, I've already spoken about this. So this is what we call in Ayurveda as primary prevention. What is the purpose of all this? Purpose is simple, to maintain samadosha, sama agni, samadhatu, and proper malakriya, which is the definition of health, part of the definition of health in Ayurveda. And then what we can do to create this primary prevention, we should create some kind of prakriti analysis drive. Everyone should know their prakriti. I think we can make a prakriti ID like everybody has an Aadhaar card. We should know our prakriti. In our office, if you come to our, everybody knows their prakriti. They, they even in the, on their desktop, they write it. And another thing we can do is Prakriti based diet and lifestyle programs can be introduced again through an app or using some technological program. So this is called the primary prevention of the body. Also in the definition of health, we talk about prasanna atmindriya mana. So there is a sensual well-being because if senses are not proper, improper contact of senses, which is called asatmindriya sanyog is one of the root causes of disease in Ayurveda. So regular washing of all the senses, regular, regular oiling of all the senses, and of course the person Atmendriya Mana, so how to keep the mind happy, which is the concept of enhancing Sattva. We have in previous lectures, we, we heard about Rajas, Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. So mind is healthy when it is dominant in Sattva. Sattvic food, Sattvic watching, Sattvic music, Sattvic environment, Sattvic association, which is called Satsanga and building a positive mindset. 
building positive and strong mental strength, which is very, very important to deal with emotional disturbances. Enhancing your sadhak pitta. Sadhak pitta is one of the pittas in our body, which is responsible for metabolizing our bad traumatic experiences. So this can be done through yoga, practicing some yama, niyama, pranayama, meditation. There's a lot of techniques in the modern world today, which are called mindfulness, being aware, awareness, being in the present. This is all coming from what we call in Ayurveda as sattva vajay chikitsa. So this is our, uh, the, the concept of primary prevention. Secondary prevention is also very important. Secondary prevention emphasizes on early disease detection and its target is always healthy, healthy people. So like uh, people who are just with subclinical forms of disease, it's not, the disease has not yet many manifested. So this is again in Ayurveda, in modern medicine, of course, there is a concept of doing this regular checkups. People go for their blood work and do some kind of tests. In Ayurveda, we can again come back to the Sadvid Kriya Kal and the first four stages of disease manifestation. We have to create a program like the Japanese people have created a Mibio program. We, we should create a program like that or we can again use technology and create some kind of a Ayurvedic health checkup, you know, questionnaire that will be very, very useful. It's not very difficult. It can be done easily. And most importantly, educating people about some simple home remedies or what we call Nidan Parivarjan and seasonal detox. I already spoke about it. Seasonally, we must get into this habit of cleaning our system every season. So that will be very useful for preventing diseases. Now, tertiary uh, prevention, you know, this is something I would like to briefly mention. Tertiary prevention is reducing the severity of disease symptoms. If you already have a disease, how, what can you do to prevent further progress of the disease? So we have disease reversal programs, especially like in our, uh, we, are, we are doing now disease reversal for diabetes, for obesity and many other diseases, the lifestyle diseases. This is something which is very, very good, even at the tertiary level. And another thing that we can, can include in this is uh, how to prevent the complication of a disease. For example, if you have diabetes, so just controlling your blood sugar level is not sufficient because after some years you might have a kidney problem, you might have a neuropathy, you might have a retinopathy or you might have some other complication. So in Ayurveda, when a diabetic patient comes to us, along with maintaining the blood sugar level, we also work on what we call this you know, tertiary prevention or like uh, trying to not uh, go into the complicated stage. Or another thing that we do is curtailing the spread of a progressive disease. There are many diseases which are progressive, which are incurable disease, neurological disorders like MND, motor neuron disease, disease muscular dystrophy, autoimmune disease, they are progressive disease. So in Ayurveda, we have wonderful protocols. Again, we work in an integrative model we don't stop the modern medicines, but we do an integrative approach, some complementary supportive treatments to curtail the progress of the disease. And I also include in this tertiary prevention category, managing the side effects of chemical medicines. This is a big problem now in the world. So many people who are taking medicines, some people are taking five tablets, 10 tablets. There's a lot of interaction between those drugs itself. Many people who are undergoing chemotherapy or other type of you know, serious problem in, uh, therapies, they have some side effects of that. So that's where Ayurveda can step in coming. And finally, talking about the promotive care, there's regular detoxification, rejuvenation. There is also many activities you can do to maintain a balance in your body, mind and soul. And after the pandemic, this thing has become very popular. So many people are coming from all over the world. In Ayurveda, there is a concept of sadvrat, which is called ethical behavior, not only just behavior, mental behavior, also physical behavior, verbal behavior, spiritual behavior. And one concept is achara rasayan, your behavioral rejuvenation, that if you behave in a particular good way, then automatically you are prevented from diseases. So this is how we talk about this tertiary and just briefly mentioning about predictive medicine, which was not covered in this. Predictive medicine can be done with prakriti very well. If you are a particular type of like a vata prakriti, 
we can definitely predict what kind of disease you will have or pitta prakriti there's a lot of work already being done in this area in what, what is called the ayur genomics where they have then done a lot of studies with genomes and connecting with ayurvedic prakriti i think some papers have already been published and lastly just to mention because this subject of this uh, conference is holistic well-being for the world and holistic well-being is incomplete without spiritual well-being because i already told you that i am not the body i am not the mind i am the soul so if i am suffering and my body is healthy and my mind is happy that doesn't complete the program you know so spiritual well-being is very nicely described in ayurveda in fact often i ask people that why do you want to be healthy people have no answer people most people they want to be healthy so that they can become unhealthy again means they want to be healthy so that they can eat more they can drink more they can party more they can enjoy more and fall sick again that is not the purpose of becoming healthy ayurveda says dharmartha kamokshanam arogyam mulamuttamo why should we become healthy so that we can carry out the four pursuits of life dharma artha kama and moksha which means we can understand the real purpose of life i can understand my real identity i can understand the connectivity of my identity my soul with other souls with environment and with the super soul and not only live healthy and happy in this world also parloka this loka and parloka ayurveda makes sure that you are prevented from all sufferings not only in this loka but also in parloka so this is the brief uh, you know uh, ayurvedic foundation of prevention and i think um, as i mentioned some takeaways during my talk we should be definitely working on some protocols which are very simple very easy to practice and they are very effective i on my personal level have been doing this in many countries i have created some small programs and i can i can show you many people who come to me and they say you have changed my life and it's not something big very small thing so i think we should start this in our country we are also working in india in many many states but i think we need to do something at the government level and at different levels thank you very much and uh, once again very very lot of thank you for inviting me and giving me opportunity to share my views namaste thank you can you hear me yes yeah thank you dr chauhan for this very very useful presentation based on your practical experience and you have given us a lot of takeaway points three stambha is one of them ahara shuddhi is another one and sadvritta achara rasayana are the others as you said jaisa khaoge ann waisa banega man this has been elaborated in the upanishads anna mayam hi somya manah so this originated in the upanishads actually the, we begin from the anna whatever we eat it goes and constitutes our mind and similarly you said the, the yoga and ayurveda combined they can be beneficial for this loka and paraloka and ayurveda itself says tasya ayushah punyatamo vedo veda vidam matah vakshyate yan manushyanam lokayo rubhayor hitam dono lokon ke liye ye hitakari hai this is beneficial for life in this world and also for the other worldly pursuits that human beings have so you have very well defined and explained the concept of well being at the physical level leading into spiritual well being thank you so much now i just keep this floor open for discussion dr arvin gupta has raised his hand dr gupta please thank you uh, dr chauhan for that uh, brilliant uh, presentation and also very reassuring that uh, small changes can make a big difference and that is the whole idea of the preventive uh, uh, ayurveda so i have uh, one comment and one uh, small question the comment is uh, uh, you know that links up with the uh, overall theme of uh, this conference which is the well being of the world 
and yesterday we were discussing uh, that how we can do that. And I think uh, a, a suggestion which was made by uh, Sachin uh, Chaturvedi and also uh, something that we at the VIF also have been pushing that in this uh, G20 presidency, we should, uh, I'm reiterating that, G20 presidency, we should try and get some mention of uh, Ayurveda or holistic health in the main outcome document. If we do that and we actually launch some kind of a G20 initiative on holistic medicine, etc., then we will get the Indian experts, doctors, philosophers, etc., will get a platform to talk about these things at a global level. So I think a very strong recommendation, maybe right up to the Prime Minister, should go from this conference that it is very important that our negotiators, you know, who are otherwise negotiating so many things for G20, but I tell you, if it is not mentioned there, then it is forgotten. So that's my first, uh, just reiteration of what I said yesterday. My question about uh, 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 flowing from what you just said is how do you determine the prakriti of a person? <laughs> so, you know, there are uh, some kind of questionnaires, you know, one of them we are also using for many years and uh, there are other organizations who have also created some so that questionnaire you need to answer. So if you will like, uh, you know, go to our website, jiva.com, there is a VPK Prakriti test there, you know, which is very easy to fill the, the questionnaire. This gives you an idea of your, your dominant dosha, you know, because we're all born with a mixture of different ratios of the three doshas. So which dosha is dominant in your body? And then of course, along with this questionnaire, it is also strongly recommended that you should also consult a Vedya and uh, the Vedya can then clarify certain you know, doubts or questions. And um, sometimes the Vedya also asks you some questions and then you can, you can determine your, your Prakriti. But the questionnaire itself helps you quite a lot to understand about your nature. And it's not something very complicated because you know who you are. You know? So it's just assisting you to, to confirm like what is, what are the dominant characteristics that you have. For example, you know, a body, you know, what is your body frame? If the body frame is like little chubby and heavy, so it's a kapha prakriti because the, the doshas are connected with the panchamahabhutas. Kapha is more earth and water. Pitta is more fire. So if your body is more, you know, prone to fiery things, fiery characteristics, so you'll be pitta. And vata is more air and space. So this is how you can, you can start and uh, you're welcome to just... Uh, come and connect with us. We'll try to also help you and uh, make sure. And as I mentioned in my lecture, you know, it, today the, we have technology, we have algorithms and we have different types of, you know, machine learning tools. We can create even, you know, automatic programs by which you can, you can fill a form. We, we also created a health app. It's not very active right now where we had this test and not only just it gives you the prakriti, it also gives you some suggestions about what you should eat, what you should not eat, about your lifestyle and all that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chauhan. Any more questions, comments, observations? One yeah, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chauhan. You have a very clearly distinguished uh, and uh, explained that uh, brahmachari is not a synonym of uh, uh, a salivate. Uh, my, just for the sake of information, I want to know from you, uh, what is the, how shall we, how shall we distinguish uh, brahmachari and jati? Brahmachari and? Jati. Yeah. Yati, what we call yati. Yati, yeah. Yeah. Brahmachari and yati. See, again, uh, my, my understanding is that all these terms, they can be used in different con context and they may have different meaning. This is the beauty of our Sanskrit language. We have to see the context and then the meaning can change. For example, brahmacharya for a for a sannyasi or for a person who is speaking spiritual, uh, spiritual, you know, well-being or who is into spiritual path, it's actually complete abstinence from from sexual indulgence. And uh, 
not only just physical they say that karmana mansa vacha you know it's all even like not talking about it not thinking about it and not you know in indulging in uh, they say that in all places in all conditions one should abstain but as i mentioned you know in our general uh, general life you know this the meaning can change for a grahastha for example you know grahastha who is in, entered into the grahastha phase of life so i would say that you know the context and meaning can change uh, from context to context this is my understanding if i may answer to yeah. that i think yati is from yam dhatu yam to control and there are five yamas in the yoga philosophy these are ahinsa satya asteya brahmacharya and aparigraha so brahmachari is the one who only follows one of the yamas who has mastered one of them but yati is the one who has mastered all the five so it is a bit wider than brahmachari that is my understanding thank you any more observations or comments please if not then we move on to the next speaker but one thing is very clear that all these presentations we are looking at there is no repetition ayurveda is such a rich repository of knowledge that different aspects and that for that i should thank dr ram manohar that all of the speakers are presenting a different dimension of ayurveda everything seems so valuable so interesting and so beneficial for the world thank you so much and dr gupta thank you for reminding us that this conference the idea of this conference originated from the fact that we want to add ayurveda and its contribution in some way or the other in the g20 presidency document and we shall try for that i think all the participants in the conference the, including the audience and those who have joined in they will all agree that this mention of ayurveda in a very effective manner should go from this conference as a recommendation i hope all will agree thank you so much with these words i go on to the next speaker he is dr sumit kumar director and cso avp research foundation coimbatore tamil nadu dr sumit kumar's topic is integration of ayurveda genomics into clinical practice for use in predictive preventive and personalized medicine all the three aspects have already been suggested by dr chauhan dr somit kumar i introduce him he is md ayurveda phd currently director research at the R avp research foundation coimbatore and ceo is also associated please mute yourself please mute yourself primary area of research for dr sumit kumar includes clinical research and reverse pharmacology in ayurveda having completed his post graduate degree in dravya guna the department of molecular biology at university of latvia to understanding and elucidating molecular mechanism behind ayurveda based formulation in the field of chronic diabetic wound healing he is also involved in research in the field of rare genetic disorder duchenne muscular dystrophy and working as co investigator in this project with the university of milan and ayush he is also co investigator for clinical study in association with the university of latvia to evaluate evaluate the efficacy of customized ayurveda therapy working as a principal investigator covid research on moderate to severe patients along stanley medical college chennai and psg medical college coimbatore funded by ayush he is also part of the author team which has translated ashtanga hridayam in the latvian language 
Dr. Somit Kumar has been an active clinician for the past 17 years and specializes in Kerala-based Panch Karma technique. His area of expertise includes the spectrum of diabetes, its complications, other metabolistic and neuroendronic disorders, skin and autoimmune disorders. Following the whole system approach in Ayurveda, his clinical consultation includes diet and lifestyle suggestions, medication in Ayurveda, yoga and cognitive counseling. He has been invited across the globe to give a presentation at international seminars, lectures and consultations in various countries across the world. He is a core faculty member of AVP Training Academy which conducts regular short time Ayurveda orientation programs for students from Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Japan, Switzerland and Latvia. Thank you, Dr. Somit Kumar, for letting us be introduced to your work and the areas of research you are working in. Now I invite you for your presentation on the topic I have already mentioned, integration of Ayurveda genomics into clinical practice for use in predictive, preventive and personalized medicine. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and also thanks for the organizers to invite me and also Dr. Raman or sir for uh, suggesting my name. Um, of course, uh, Ayurveda as uh, a science or a systems medicine is what is we talk about. And uh, if I'm given the permission to share, uh, can I share my screen? Sure. Yes, you can. Uh, is my screen shared, ma'am? Yes, yes, please, you can. Just go unmute, Karo. You can share. You are mm -hmm. I have sharing your, you are not sharing your presentation. You have shared your, the, the WebEx screen. Sorry, sir. Mm -hmm. If you want, it can be shared from here, from the analyst system analyst at our end. Okay. Um, it is in uh, Keynote. May I send as a PDF? Yes, yes, you may please. Hello. Share keynote in window, not full screen, then you can easily share it. Okay, ma'am. So it is window. Contact time card. Something is blocking, sir. I think I don't know. Somehow, in not a line. Dr. Ram Manohar, can you please help? If you have the paper. No, I think uh, uh, mm, ma'am, if he if he shares the PPT to ARO at the yes, then we'll uh, it could be yeah. That's what we suggested. That's what we suggested. Uh, sir, I have shared a, an email ID. Can you share your PPT uh, to that email ID? 
Yeah, just a moment. Okay. Please check your WhatsApp, sir. Have you sent the email, please? Yes, ma'am. This just is getting. It's sent. Uh, if you can just look at that ARO thing. Please check. Please check. Can I begin? Yeah, it has, yeah, it has, it has yeah. reached us. Thank you. Sorry for this uh, technological glitch. So, in fact, uh, it was very nice uh, precursor to this whole talk of Dr. Chohan talking about um, how Ayurveda genomics is getting uh, popular and a lot of uh, research spearheaded initially by a team at JNU, uh, Iogenomics project and Tri Sutra project under Mitali ma'am and Bhavana ma'am has uh, laid a strong foundation for uh, Ayurveda genomics and its use in uh, clinical practice, whether it is predictive medicine, preventive medicine or personalized medicine. Because as we all know that uh, the next generation uh, practice of integrative medicine is basically going to be 
precisely weaved around these three concepts that it should be first predictive, then preventive, and also personalized. Even when we talk about predictive or preventive medicine, the core idea is how do we personalize? Because one pill being answered to any genotype or phenotype of a disease may not be true. And cancer is one of the burning example where when we thought about when we discovered certain anti-cancerous medicines, even for a simple cancer like breast cancer, we know about the lot of uh, phenotypic variations which uh, responds to different types of uh, medication. And in fact, this was one of the core concept of Ayurveda. Next slide, please. Now, if you talk about Ayurveda, Ayurveda is systems-based approach. Now, we talk about uh, reductionism that, okay, is a pill answer to each and every type of disease or a specific disease? No. Why? Because a disease is a state of imbalance in a system where it is surrounded by many other factors. So that's why our human body is said to be as open system. Now, why I'm talking about system? Because an open system interacts with its environment. And that's what in Ayurveda, we talk about yat pindande, tat brahmande. That means the pindanda, the individual system, which we call as our body, is interconnected to whole cosmos. And this is one of the cardinal important feature of when we talk about systems approach and customization of this systems approach. Next slide, please. Now, we talk about Ayurveda as a complex system approach. Why? Because there are many factors which interact with your human body. So whenever you are trying to predict or prevent or personalize a medicine for a person, you have to take a complex environment around it. Why? Because the climate impacts it, the flora and fauna around impacts it, that place, in fact, in Ayurveda, there are 10 factors which impact it. Dushyam, Desham, Balam, Kalam, Analam, Prakritim, Vayam, Sattvam, Satmyam, Ahara, Vastacha. So there are 10 level of interactions which happens with your human body which creates a complex web of activity and disease response. So when you talk about uh, management or prevention of a disease in a human body, you have to take a lot of other factors which interacts with a complex human system. Next slide, please. Now, how does it interact? What are the levels of interaction? So it is not just physical body which is interacting. It's also interacting with a lot of non-linear systems around you. Non-linear means you cannot predict always that how you will respond to a raise in temperature. So a raise in temperature when it happens in Himachal Pradesh and a raise in temperature which happens in South of India in Coimbatore where I am seeing, your response to that one degree raise in temperature and metabolism in human body is totally non-linear and very dynamic, which has to be understood. So there's a lot of complexity as to how. That's why we, when Chauhan sir was talking about Dinacharya and Ritucharya, what is it? It is interaction of your human body with diurnal variation. That means intensity of sunlight, your temperature, humidity, many other environmental factors which interacts and impacts your physiology in human body. And that is seen as a lot of uh, variations which we see in terms of hormonal rhythms. We see in terms of metabolic uh, changes which happens in your body. So that's why we in Ayurveda do not just talk about a linear but a non-linear interaction of human body with the environment around us and it is ever evolving and adaptive because the moment you change either your place or your climate or your other factors which is interacting with you it is adaptive 
and that's why in different season you eat differently so when the environment around you is cold you tend to eat more hot food or more uh, so, uh, so you start eating more uh, oily food see if you see the kind of kashmiri palau which is used in north of india is most more sweet having more uh, kind of uh, uh, dry fruits and nuts which are harder to digest but the same pulao or biryani in south of india is more spicy why because the country or the climate or the geographical situations impact your human physiology digestion your other rhythms so it is ever evolving and adaptive and it is network one system interacts with other nothing is in isolation so that's why it's a complex human body but then when we talk about complexity it is very difficult to then treat a human body with a very clear defined guidelines but then ayurveda tried to create certain networks and patterns and that is where we talk about your body type next slide please so a set of networks and pattern now if you look at this slide this is chaos theory in fact when your human body interacts with your environment around there are so many informations so many energy there are so many interaction happens with your body with the environment around you that you feel that it is a chaos but is this is a chaos next slide please it is not a chaos it is a pattern in the chaos if you look at this mobius ring it's very well established that though a complex system looks very haphazard undefined not comprehensible there is a pattern and that is what ayurvedic thought process started observing through centuries of experience how human body behaves with its environment and its interaction uh, with different attributes it started understanding body into certain patterns next slide please now i was stuck talking to you even from a modern uh, scientific basis it has been proved that many of your physiological activities not the same in different parts of the day because if you see you are you have a rise of blood pressure early in the morning as well as in the evening now if you see you have the best cardiovascular muscle strength is in the evening around 4 to 5 o'clock now why i'm trying to state that that any physiology which happens in your body is having a circadian rhythm a rhythm which interacts to intensity of sunlight and other factors around you and feeding pattern when you eat so dr chauhan was talking about very unique thing is and very simple also that means eat on time sleep on time and plan your activity as per dinacharya you will ultimately start balancing the uh, the surges of these kind of metabolic and hormonal changes in the body next slide please here you see i have just overlapped this is a a, a, a specific circadian rhythm chart of your human body that means it is called as chronotherapeutics where uh, the uh, scientists have studied about different enzymes different hormones different activity happening in your body and when you overlap it it's very interesting to note that the diurnal variation of doshas in ayurveda has been also told where first morning 6 to 10 is kapha time which is more obstructive it's more kind of you know increasing uh, certain uh, hormones and stress hormones which can increase oculopathy and 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 what we are seeing is occlusions and so you see similar kind of rise of stress hormones happens in the morning heart rate is high blood pressure now why i tell, try to tell this is because when you talk about practice of yoga when you do you do it early in the morning when you talk about surya namaskar it is at the sun time of sunrise and when you do a surya namaskar at the sunrise you see you end up uh, secreting lot of uh, non stress hormones and try to moderate the uh, hormones which are stress inducing the first half of the day 
And if you do a Surya Namaskar at the sunrise, then only you optimize the benefit. But if you start doing Surya Namaskar at 8 o'clock, where already your blood pressure and heart rate is very high, your stress hormones are high, you don't get the benefit. So it's very important that the science aligns with the traditional uh, regime of Dinacharya and Ritucharya. It's also very important that how do we communicate to our people who listen to this in a a proper validated way. So what we require is, is this traditional knowledge, knowledge system has to be aligned with this scientific uh, validation and be uh, catered as a curriculum or as a integrated syllabus where we see and we teach these kind of correlations. Thank you. Next slide, please. This is a very unique, uh, very interesting research done by a, uh, a Israeli scientist where what they have done is they have basically studied different stress hormones and different uh, uh, hormones and growth hormones and uh, metabolites throughout the year. If you see all the factors, they are not same throughout the year in each month. It changes now. Even the, uh, the size of the pituitary gland changes over different seasons. If you see, it reduces during summer season and then increases in the autumn and the winter season. That means that these hormones and organs respond to different seasons in a different way. So that's why the whole concept of eating local, eating seasonal has a lot of science behind it, which has to be reestablished, validated by proper research where these are just hypotheses, these are observations, but we need to take a lot of initiative to do a good basic research where these thought process has to be combined and then more and more clinical data has to be generated. Next slide, please. So what is Ayurveda genomics? So we talk about today that anything in human body is becoming molecular and and so was Ayurveda talking about five elements. Uh, it was quite interesting to see that the whole DNA and RNA mechanism, which guides all and every activity of your body, they are blueprint of your human body, are basically based on five nucleotides, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, and uracil, which is in mRNA. It also talks about five basic, uh, basic nucleotides, which can create the blueprint of your human body we also talk about five elements which has a specific uh, energy a mass and information so this is a very unique area an interesting area of understanding as to where pop people need to talk about matter energy and information so there is a trial which is coming up where we talk about how matter and energy can create in, in, information and Mahabhuta concept is a very unique in, example of that matter energy uh, information system. And based on the permutation and combination of this five element, we talk about three basic distinct subtype of body that is Vata, Pitta, Kapha or uh, entity, not body, uh, functional unit. And based on this, your human body gets consolidated and then the dhatus more, more, more and more physical form is called dhatus and from dhatus their different organ comes. So in Ayurveda, there is a very clear molecular understanding of connection between five elements to the dhatus, the tissues and then tissues to the organ. And so taking an account of this information which is told in Sushruta, for example, you have a disease with a kidney. Now, according to Sushruta, rakta medha sapasada jaha vrikkau that kidney is made out of rakta and that is blood very uh, broadly and fat tissues. Now, we have seen in our clinical practice that many of these kidney failure cases do suffer from anemia and dyslipidemia. Now, it can be just a coincidence, but it, it is well also established in science that this is true. Now, there has to be a lot of researches on the molecular level and to understand as to can there be parallels drawn with such kind of interdisciplinary researches. So 
that's why we say that ayurveda can play a major role from a concept of prakriti vikriti and other uh, concepts which are told in ayurvedic text to create a new stream of personalized medicine based on ayurvedic thought process next slide please so we the main principles of course dr uh, Chauhan has still, so I will not repeat, is Dhinacharya Ritucharya, then use of a lot of preventive and anti-aging medicines like Guduchi. See, Guduchi is, when we say, uh, one of the best Rasayanas or Medha Rasayanas told in Ayurvedic texts, Guduchi, Yashti Madhu, Brahmi, Sankha Pushpi. These are four basic Medha Rasayana, not only Medha Rasayana, just told in terms of only improving the memory, but Medha as our interpretation, broader interpretation, inter, uh, interpretation is also the cellular information. The nucleus has the information or blueprint of the whole cell. So senescence or the longevity of the cells can also be impacted by these uh, uh, these kind of herbs. So Guruji not only improves your uh, memory but also the 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 quality of the genomic material which is in the cells and also improves the lifespan. So there are researches done on Guduchi's anti-aging activity also or uh, one of the uh, components of Trifala like Amalaki Rasayanam has been talked about where it not only elongates telomere or has epigenetic modulation but also it Im improves the overall uh, longevity and health of uh, human beings. So such kind of researches have to be promoted and then we have to create more evidence base for these all uh, research, uh, these all herbs. Next slide, please. So this is from Bhavana Ma'am's uh, uh, kind of uh, one of the publication which talks about what should be the metrics of predictive, preventive and personalized medicine. And we talk about very important thing is even Dr. Chauhan talked about is fetal meta, uh, fetal nutrition. So fetal nutrition plays a very important role in what, how the uh, the child would have a uh, life expectancy because it is proven that people with uh, you know uh, deficient diet deficient. Uh, pregnancy or no proper diet was given during pregnancy led to a shorter uh, lifespan. And there's a gouty mice experiment already very popular. And so what is Garbhini Parishare? What to eat during the pregnancy impacts the longevity. And once you are born, there are shoulder samskaras told in Ayurveda that not only longevity depends on fetal nutrition, but also what you eat during uh, once you're born, how you are fed? So we talk about chirada, chiranada, where child is just on mother's milk, and then annaprasana, what what to when to start giving the food for the child, and there are sixteen other samskaras till he becomes a adult. We have to find out the scientific rationale behind it, and there are to be a lot of studies to be done talking about how this will enrich the. Uh, uh, the uh, genomic excellence of uh, please, humans please. so that they can be uh, better, uh, have a longer and uh, yes, disease yes, life. Yes, next, yes, next slide, please. Yes, Somebody next has unmuted. Please mute yourself, all the participants. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So when I was talking about that, what was Ayurveda's program for predictive health? So when we talk about we are a very complex uh, network of uh, information, different, uh, different physiology, different anatomical features. There has to be some clustering mechanism. There has to be some kind of clusters being made. And this is what where Ayurveda concept of Prakriti came into being. And where 
one very unique thing which it also talks about is predictiveness that if you are of a certain constitution you may be more prone to like vata people are more prone to neurological diseases dementia speech disorder arrhythmia and other diseases which is related to movement next slide please pitta genotype or what we say ap phenotype rather being more uh, uh, specific they are more prone to ulcer bleeding disorder skin diseases autoimmune disorder these are already published papers by bhavna ji and her team so what we are talking about is also predictive nature now are these really seen in our clinical practice is my second part of our presentation where we took all this information now second uh, next slide please kafa kafa is more uh, genotype is more prone to obesity diabetes atherosclerosis or other condition now next slide please so based on this background uh, one of our participant asked about are these question as uh, uh, properly reliable so in our uh, clinical practices at avp research foundation we have uh, basically real, uh, you know standardized a form prakriti based form which is basically from the publication from our genomic team and we do a proper cronback alpha prakriti questionnaire um, reliability analysis and we found out it is moderately to high reliable like you know 0.6 to 0.7 this is moderately high reliable uh, questionnaire and then we give this to our patients who get admitted next slide please so what we are seeing is there has to be a tool of analysis which is more dependable and more reliable and repeatable so that we do not get unreliable results next so i will show you a case sheet where based on this prakriti analysis we did a a, a further um, uh, analysis on on a quiz palis uh, uh, scale where we found out that based on this quiz right suppose we take their uh, there are three prakritis with uh, uh, 100 odd questions and then we do a statistical analysis as to we found out that this particular case is pitta kapha but pitta kapha is non statistically different that means dvidoshaja so in ayurveda there is a very unique concept of shreshta nindya dvidoshaja dvidoshaja prakriti sometimes when the two doshas are equally statistically predominant they may be tend to more kind of diseases than other sub type and then what kind of diseases like i told you if kapha and pitta that means diseases related to metabolism basically fat metabolism and other thing and a pitta basically related to rakta dhatu liver and all other issues can happen skin issues can happen so let us see what we do is also we have started a new program where we are in integrating uh, a team from modern genomics who do as snips analysis as well as uh, gut microbiome analysis next slide please so what can we found doctor, out very dr somit yeah. kumar may i i'm sorry for interruption but please try to conclude early because we still have six more presentations in the afternoon so this is five minutes i can is... um... yeah please thank you so much yes so sleep guided analysis what we found out that that what we found out in the uh, initial predisposition that rakta dhatu and meda dhatu which is may broadly be correlated to fat metabolism and hem uh, hematological parameters the same patient found that snip guided genome expression had such a uh, a high expression next slide please this is not new of course bhavna ma'am has uh, team has also done but what we are doing is as part of our regular clinical practice we have started doing this and what we found out also in cardiovascular risk because of these parameters also is uh, highly expressed next slide please next is skin we talked about skin uh, where you have a bhrajak pitta pitta related uh, response it's also very highly expressed next slide please then another skin and other issues which is prone to more pitta genotype also was expressed in this person so what we are trying to see that what has been our classical information 
told in our text do corroborate to the clinical practices uh, in many cases. But yes, we need a larger sample size. So this is a case study. There are also uh, cohort studies which we are doing where we are making such predictive models. Next slide, please. This is gut microbiome. You see, again, liver, skin, again shows the same person with from the gut microbiome also it's having a same predictive uh, nature and which corroborates your your prakriti pariksha your gut analysis as well as snips analysis all come to a very coherent uh, outcome next slide please next slide so based on that liver wellness i was telling you pitta related organ it showed it's not uh, optimally good. And of course, gut related bi microbiome has to be improved. So Agni Pariksha has to be done and a proper probiotic or uh, Ahara based on this uh, uh, individual genotype has to be given. Next slide, next slide. We can run. Inflammatory bowel disease, again, predisposition high. This is a, a, a very unique research we are doing on we know that there are diseases because of many genes and one gene. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is an incurable disease which has only one gene. So we expect low variation. That means population will not show so much of variation of the disease. In this, we did Pariti, Pariti, Priksha again and Vikriti. Next slide, please. What we found out that a particular subtype, next slide. So even with one gene, you have so much of variation. Now what we did with Prakriti and deletion pattern, we try to overlap. What was interesting to see that if we get 200 different types of Duchenne muscular dystrophy with diff, this kind of deletion pattern, we would have a very strong correlation between your Ayurvedic Prakriti as well as deletion pattern. So this is a very interesting and encouraging result which we are pursuing and we are looking for a bigger sample size next slide please and we have seen that a specific pitta kapha type of you know genotype or prakriti have responded better to our response uh, to our therapy so their deterioration is much better both on pet school quality of life next slide please as well as improving their ejection fraction, heart function, and other. So what we are seeing that all the subtypes are not responding, but a particular subtype is responding better. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So if you see creatinine kinase, Pitta Kapha is better, Tidosha is better. But then in wherever there is no deterioration if you see pitta kapha is showing no deterioration in lung function because people in this the children's die because of lung failure and heart failure see in those particular parameters pitta kapha subtype in this because the sample size is not small it is more than 53 and the, the incidence is one in three thousand kids we get this so it's quite interesting to say that the we can sometimes predict with this data as to if you are a particular type of uh, type, body type or prakriti, your response may be different. Next slide, last, next, next slide, last. Yes, this is another disease where we have taken a, a where the disease is not because of one gene, but multiple gene and Diabetes is one we were talking about. Can we make a bigger cohort? So this is a, a, a result from 57 patients. Next slide. So we got so many subtypes. What we found interesting is that people who are more Tridosha Pitta Kapha and, uh, and Tridosha uh, based on our uh, analysis, Tridosha Pitta Kapha and Kapha Pitta and Tridosha Prakriti at the baseline, their response to therapy was better. But then, next slide, we added one more parameter. I told you there are 10 parameters in Ayurveda, but we added Prakriti and Vikriti together. Then what happens was the 
precision in increases. So you decide a therapy based on prakriti and also based on vikriti. Your precision increases. The response is more precise. Next slide, please. You can see that change. That if you based on just predict based on prakriti, two subtypes were responding better. Uh, three sub uh, uh, three subtypes were responding better. But when you start integrating prakriti and vikriti together, we found out that the combination of both the response rate becomes very specific. And we found that that people with pitta kapha prakriti, a uh, kapha pitta prakriti and pitta kapha imbalance like vikriti and tridoshaja prakriti and kapha vata uh, uh, vikriti, they respond better. Now, why I'm trying to show you this is, is because when you talk about precision based Ayurveda intervention, we need to come out granular. So you talk about a whole holistic approach, but at the same time, when you are customizing, you have to customize with a lot of information at the back end. And that's where uh, the new age, the AI and other uh, tools of technology will help us to get into deeper details with larger sample size. We have to take a lot of research in uh, IU genomics and, and amplify this data with bigger data sets to understand as to how Ayurveda, though being holistic, still uh, approaches granularly and gives uh, therapy for each and every individual uh, individually. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sumit Kumar. Your presentation was very well documented and about the preventive, predictive and personalized medicine, you have presented this approach. I thank you on behalf of this committee, organizing committee of the conference, but I'm afraid we don't have time for discussion at the moment. Because we, as I said earlier, we still have six more speakers. So we disperse for a quick lunch and come back and join at 1.40, as mentioned in the schedule. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.